Good morning, everyone. Uh, this, the Wednesday, March 2nd, uh, 2022, regular meeting of the Nags Head Board of Commissioners is hereby called to order. Um, we'll start with our moment of silence. I trust that um, Ukraine and the people of Ukraine are on many of our minds, and uh, that would be a, a good place to spend a few moments of thought this morning. And now, if you will, stand as you're able to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, the next item on our agenda would be the adoption of the agenda, and a motion would be in order. So moved. I have, a, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, that brings us to recognitions, and uh, we will start with a very special and unique uh, recognition this morning, something that I don't believe has happened in the town nags head before. Um, so at this time, I would like to invite uh, former Town Commissioner John Ratzenberger to the podium, if you would, please. And if she will, please, I'd like for Annette Ratzenberger to also come to the podium. So. Good morning, John and Annette. Uh, welcome to you and your family members who are here with you uh, today. For those of you who do not know John Ratzenberger, he is a retired U.S. Army Colonel who also served as a civilian computer engineer for the Army. He traveled the world with significant time in Germany and Korea supporting the Army's mission. John and Annette moved to Nags Head in 2003, after which John began a well-known newsletter focused on weather and local government issues. John served on the Beach Nourishment Finance Committee, eight years on the town's personnel grievance panel, six years on the Citizens Advisory Committee, one year on the town's 50th birthday committee, and two years on the planning board, and four years as commissioner. In public service, it is helpful to have a partner, which Annette is in all things. However, Annette, Annette Ratzenberger has also served Nags Head in noteworthy ways. Before retirement, Annette was chief of engineering at the U.S. Joint Forces Command, where she briefed, among others, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld on warfare simulation. Annette serves on the Village at Nags Head HOA board, served on the same Beach Nourishment Committee as John, presenting that committee's report in 2006. She served on the Solid Waste and Recycling Committee, and as we recognized her for recently, served a decade on the Fireman's Relief Fund Board of Trustees. And in all these things, John likewise supports her. Your determined and passionate service to our community have made impacts like few others. We recognize your tireless service over the years and want you to know that we appreciate all that you have done for our town. For these reasons, John and Annette, the town of Nags Head is honored and proud to name each of you Nags Head Lightkeeper. Head Lightkeeper Award is for those who have helped shape the image and direction of the town. We're glad your family could be here with you today so that they can see the important impacts you have each made on Nags Head. You are each now part of an esteemed group of individuals who helped to shape our town through their selfless contributions. Your names will be inscribed on a perpetual plaque at Nags Head Town Hall so that everyone is reminded of you and inspired to service. Thank you very much. And now if the board will come around and John and Annette, you will join us.
and, and we got involved a lot, and I don't want to take up a lot of time, but we got involved a lot because of, of um, uh, Ralph. Burrell came down when, when uh, the first year we were here when, when um, what was that? Isabel came through and broke the water line in front of our house. So we will continue with our uh, presentations, and next I will call on Chief Webster to recognize uh, Christian this morning. Mayor, Board of Commissioners, thank you for allowing us to recognize the five years of service of Detective Christian Aguirre to our community. Detective Aguirre began working for Nag City Police Department in January of 2017. Prior to joining the department, he had already come, he already had several years of experience working with Franklin County Sheriff's Office in Pennsylvania, Dare County Sheriff's Office, and the Huntersville Police Department. Prior to his law enforcement career, Christian served with the U.S. Army 82nd Airborne Division for four years and was stationed at Fort Bragg. Christian is a certified general instructor, is one of the few dr uh, drug recognition experts in the region, and assists in instruction of DRE, Drug Recognition Expert, SFST, which is Standardized Field Sobriety Training, or testing, and ARID, Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement. Most recently, Christian achieved the rank of Master Police Officer and was then promoted to the rank of Detective as a member of the Criminal Investigation Division. Christian lives in Nags Head and is married to his wife, Jenna, and they have a son, Lincoln. He enjoys running, spending time with his family. Christian, we look forward to your many years of service to the town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we had another recognition on the agenda this morning, but um, that uh, individual is not able to be with us this morning, so we will do that at a, at a future meeting. Um, the next item on our agenda is an update from the Committee for Arts and Culture, and I'll call on Paige Griffin. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, morning. Commissioners. Good morning. Um, we are waiting for a slideshow to pop up. Here we go. Um, five years. Does it seem like we've been doing this for five years? <laughs> but what a fun year it was. Uh, we had great success uh, with our vendors and our guests and have repeatedly heard that. 
Um, am I allowed to use that with this? This? The mouse. The mouse. Sorry. Yeah, just click. Mm. Oh, can you move? Left. Move to click. Yep. Um, there we go. Um, statistics. I know that you have received um, most of this already. I think one of the most impressive things um, that uh, occurred this past year was we had 85 people, 85 vendors. Uh, that's quite a bit. Um, and over half of them uh, were our consumables and perishables, farmers, produce, bakers, um, those type people who, people who provide plants, that um, allow us to actually be um, designated as a farmer's market. Um, we did have them come from all over as far as our vendors, Swan Quarter, Edenton, um, Currituck, Hertford was added this year as well as Columbia and Elizabeth City. Uh, we did have an increase and I think our highest was 750 and that was in July, obviously. Um, that's our highest time as far as the visitors that we have. And the visitors uh, came from everywhere. It was funny, I met a group of ladies who uh, would rent uh, a van and they would come to the beach on Thursdays because Dowdy Park Farmers Market, they would hit us first, they would go uh, tor to to Tortugas to eat <laughs> and then they would hit a couple of other spots and then they'd truck back home to Elizabeth City. Wow. So for us to become That's a destination, cool. um, that is something to be said. So very proud of that. The advertising, we continued just to do um, social media as far as Facebook and Instagram. We really didn't pay a, a much for advertising this past year. And our summer market vendors, uh, generated 15, actually between the two, summer market was about 15,000, uh, but if you add the holiday markets, we were around 21, 20,000, 21,000, I think, uh, between the two, so not bad. These are just some of our consumables that come from all over. More of those. We have definitely, uh, made ourselves uh, accessible to the community with consumables and the fact that 15 of them were new to us this year and some of our other um, vendors. We have almost created a brand for ourselves. Uh, we do have vendors specifically, um, I'm looking at Denise Turner, which is right in front of us. She, we are very fortunate that she chooses to just do our market. And we do have uh, several artisan crafts that just do Dowdy Park Market. Even though there are other choices um, on the beach now, that seems to be where they put their energy. So for that, we're grateful. This, uh, this was my um, thought process <laughs> during COVID, uh, taking the next generation. I'll take it back to being an educator. Uh, we were very fortunate that uh, we were able to offer this program. It was a series of four classes, and I basically adapted them to um, creating a small business. We worked on logos. We worked on um, how to display your table. We worked on telling your spiel. We worked on how to price things. Um, you know, profits and things like that, and then how to put that money back into your product and, uh, and continue to make money. I cannot believe the amount of money these children made. <laughs> and I guess I shouldn't yeah. call them children. But um, some of them were at a different point than others, but even the marketing uh, that they did blew my mind. They actually ended up teaching me uh, quite a bit with TikTok and the reels. Um, and we ended up using them uh, for Dowdy Park. So it was a great relationship. Uh, we hope to continue this this next year. About four to five are all that I can handle um, right now, but uh, I have two, uh, hopefully, that will join us this next year. So that was a lot of fun. Our holiday markets, we did four this year. Uh, three were on Saturday, um, and then we had one night market. 
Uh, the other happenings that we had were uh, music. We continued with that. We did movies. Um, had people in music from local areas. I think <coughs> Richmond was the furthest. Uh, the Outer Banks Women's Club uh, dedicated their bench, and then the Breaking Through also had a couple of um, different workshops that we ended up using here uh, in Nags Head with our staff, and then they also did a chalk talk for us. So that community outreach is still there that we're allowing um, the market to be used that way. You'll notice the planning, there's lots. <laughs> um, for 2022, we want to continue the markets. We are running into an issue with parking. Um, and so right now the markets, I believe last year we did 16. This year we're looking at 11. Uh, there is a possibility uh, in talking with the Arts and Cultural Committee that will maybe move some to Saturday um, just because of the parking at Nags Head. Um, we need to be able to utilize their space, even though we use Bonnet Street, and we also, our vendors basically park at Bonnet and the YMCA. Um, we're looking at possibly a Saturday market at the end, towards the end of the season, once school starts. Uh, the vendor fees will remain the same. Because of parking, we probably will keep a firm 50 um, because if you have 50 cars that are your vendor cars and then you want to still have um, guests, uh, we're probably going to limit it this year as far as our vendors. The Arts and Cultural Committee would like to do a fall festival um, and they are continuing to um, look at the holiday markets as um, this next year in 2022 and considering having a town decorating contest and um, enhancing decorations for the town's um, entrances. Next year, they've also talked about possibly offering a winter or what we call <coughs> off-season market. This would probably uh, happen on Saturdays and um, be once or twice a month, depending on funding and those type things. And then the second uh, tree lighting, we actually correlated the tree lighting with our Thanksgiving market, which was held on a Saturday. And it was a long day, but it was so rewarding. We had um, the market in the morning and then the tree lighting at night. Um, and that was a lot of fun. We had a great um, showing for the first year. So looking to build on that. Um, continue to have music on the lawn, uh, continue to have our fitness opportunities. We typically do yoga um, on Tuesdays and then uh, our summer concert series and then movies on the lawn. These are other initiatives, but let me go back. Um, so in looking at this, you, there's always ask things to ask for, things to play them for. And um, the committee uh, would like to explore the possibility of providing a sponsorship program, meaning area businesses or even individuals would sponsor a movie or um, would sponsor um, the uh, fitness opportunities that we have. Bob has been very gracious for many, three years actually, and Village Realty has provided that. Um, and so the opportunity to highlight our area businesses and then also allow them to, um, to feed back in the community with their funds for us to provide things at Dowdy Park. That's one of the areas that's an ask. Um, another ask is uh, a volunteer program. Uh, we would like to have uh, the opportunity to be able to create a volunteer program um, and uh, I feel like there are people here that don't have a niche to fit in yet. Dowdy Park is an easy place. I'm actually not hard to work with, and I'm not that bossy, but would love to have people come in in the mornings to help our vendors, to help things set up, and also to be ambassadors. It has grown so much that it's difficult for me to uh, do my duties and yet still talk to guests. 
and I love talking to our guests. I like to see what they like, where they're from, why they're here. Um, those are the things that drive um, the grant processes that we actually have from the tourism board. And so I need other helpers for that. Um, and so that's the second ask. And then the third ask would be um, money for the holiday lights and um, the holiday tree lighting that we have to continue to grow that. Um, that I feel like that would be um, something that would be well received and would continue as far as um, the holiday time, the festivities that we have there. So I think the next part of this, these are other initiatives. Um, as far as the art mass project, uh, we received, um, we finished that part. We'd like to start another and seek another round of artists. The artists do receive a $500 stipend um, for their time and their materials. And then we have also started to, um, actually it's been put out, the meeting is tomorrow, I believe, uh, for the Whalebone uh, Park initiatives and trying to see what the community wants. There's a, there's a meeting on it. Um, the public is invited and uh, would like to see what they want, what they envision at Wellbone Park. <coughs> and explore the rain barrel art opportunities, um, displaying the original art panels within Town Hall, and then continue to explore the, uh, the art piece that <coughs> Tanger Outlet gave us. And at, that's actually at Harvey Track. And then the adopt a program or the friends of program. I mentioned that earlier in the volunteer uh, part of it. And then a big thank you. We could not do what we do, um, one without your vision and two without the um, amazing people that we have that have become a part of this. Um, I saw someone in the grocery store last week and she was asking when, um, when Dowdy Park was going to start again and she said to her it is the beginning of the season and I thought hmm I don't really think of it that way but it brings her that much joy that she can walk to the park, uh, see her friends, um, have community outreach with other people and then uh, to be able to uh, buy her goods for the week and that is her start of season and uh, to say that we have created that and we have added that to the community um, goes to everyone that's been involved so do you have any questions I know that was a lot in a short amount of time it is I'll start at this end Renee. I don't know that I have questions as much as I have comments Paige you've done a marvelous job I'd like to thank you very much for all the work you've done. Um, it's grown beyond anything I ever envisioned. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to thank Kelly because I know she's out there a lot as well. Thank you. And to all the volunteers that help you. Um, I think your ask are uh, reasonable. Um, and I look forward to discussing those in the budget process as well. But um, I'm just very appreciative. It's, it's just amazing to me. and. I was absolutely astounded at your holiday market, how many people and vendors you had. Mm -hmm. You had a huge amount of vendors. Yeah. And I learned my lesson. If you see something, buy it. Don't wait to walk around and see everything because by the time you get back, it's going to be gone. Yeah. But, um, yes. yeah, it's a great job, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> no, uh, no questions, but again, much like Renee said, thank you for your efforts that you put forth to make the market a success. Kelly and the other members of town staff that helped. I had the opportunity to attend several of the farmers markets and just, just it's such a happy place. Yeah. Um, and the visitors that, that you're able to get. Uh, I did the nighttime holiday market and just could not believe the number of vendors you had, the, the, the merchandise they had for sale. It was just very nice. And much like Renee, I believe your uh, asks are reasonable and look forward to discussing those as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, I feel the same as the other commissioners. I mean, you guys have done a great job. Um, I love your vision and the vision that the town has had, just, you know, watching this thing grow over five years and 
and how Dowdy Park has grown over the years too to just be a really gym and axe head. And um, uh, yeah, I think your ass are great. I think that uh, having a couple of holiday markets on Saturday would be a great idea. I've heard from uh, um, a few people that uh, they can't always get to the Thursday ones because they're working. So, so, and I love the uh, young entrepreneurs. <laughs> I know a couple of them and they did do really well. So uh, yeah, it's been great and, and big thanks to you guys and the town. Um, Thank you. Can we get on the record, for those who may be listening and, and need to know, uh, the time and place of tomorrow's meeting about Whalebone Park? Kelly, I can see the bulletin in my head. I can't. Sure. Um, and I hopefully this will pick up. But it's going to be tomorrow, 4.30 to 7, here in the boardroom. Um, the public is welcome to show up. Uh, we'll have our senior environmental planner, Kate Jones, available with some concepts. Um, and we'll be here and happy to take any uh, suggestions or recommendations. So 4.30 to 7, tomorrow here at the boardroom. Come with your suggestions. Very good. Um, a couple of comments from me before we, we let you go. Um, you mentioned the, the, the branding. Um, uh, my daughter grew up here in Nags Head. Um, she's 30 some years old. She said when I was growing up here, I never, I knew I was a beach kid. I didn't think of myself as being a Nags Head citizen. She said, but I see all the excitement that people express about playing in Dowdy Park and taking their children to Dowdy Park now that she's a mom. And, and the markets and everything, and she says, I think of myself as a nags head person now, mm -hmm. proudly so. And so you have, you know, the park has built a brand, um, and I appreciate um, uh, and urge the continued sort of careful curation of that, you know, dealing with the parking so that that doesn't become sort of a, a, a black eye for the, for the park. Um, uh, uh, curating the vendors very carefully so that it's a true farmer's market and the other things that have been done there um, that I think Nags Head has been very smart to be careful and to take baby steps and not get out ahead of ourselves and I think I think we've been well served by that approach at the at the park so um, that that's it from me and thank you very much right, thank you Uh, the next item on our agenda is a presentation uh, from George Bonner on the waves to water from the North Carolina Renewable Energy uh, Program, Ocean Energy Program. Welcome. Hey, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning to provide an update on our waves to water event that's coming up here in April, as well as an update on our North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Program testing program that we have at Jeanette's, and we're really blessed uh, at Coastal Studies Institute to have this partnership with North Carolina Aquariums and Jeanette's Pier. It's really a great platform for us to test marine energy devices as we develop these technologies. Um, so researchers from across the UNC system are able to take advantage of this testing opportunity so we can advance these technologies and, uh, and do it in a responsible way. And uh, so it's a great partnership and I appreciate the support that we've had from the town of Nags Head. As we've, as we've developed this program and also we're planning for waves to water. Um, every, every time we put a device in the water, we put together a comprehensive safety and environmental plan. And um, you know, we have divers in the water, we have uh, boats in the water, there's lifting operations from the pier. So we, we put a lot of attention into that plan and we um, stay engaged with the um, town emergency services folks and I appreciate the support there. There we go. So, uh, I mentioned uh, last year when I was providing an update, we were selected uh, by the Department of Energy to host this Waves to Water prize competition. So there's over $3 million in prize funding available for this event. Um, we've been working with the Department of Energy over the last two years. And this event's um, really focused on inspiring innovation in harnessing the power of wave energy to power reverse osmosis so we can um, take ocean water and provide clean drinking water. Um, with using renewable energy. And um, we've tested these type devices at Jeanette's Pier in the past. And in fact, one of the four finalists that's gonna compete in the drink phase, the testing phase at Jeanette's Pier here in April is a, a collaboration of researchers that grew from our program uh, from North Carolina State University and UNC Charlotte. So it's great that we have a local North Carolina team competing in this final uh, phase of the competition. Uh, so. A lot of planning went on when we were going to have this event, when was the right time to have it. Uh, 
So we obviously want to impact uh, fishing operations on the pier. We want to minimize impacts to tourism, minimize impacts to spring break, you know, but also have a weather window when it was a good time to have it. So we focused in on <coughs> April, and uh, so we're going to kick things off on the 30th of March, and we're going to have several events um, leading up to that. And you can see in the picture here, the bl blue at shady areas, that's where we're going to test the devices. The devices will be in the water. Uh, we tested one that the Department of Energy uh, developed a couple of weeks ago off Jeanette's Pier, and the picture on the, on the lower left is us deploying that device. Um, so we're really excited about it. I think it's a great opportunity to, you know, not only um, promote these type of innovations, but also, you know, get students and kids involved and, um, and educate the public on, on these opportunities uh, moving forward with, with renewable energy. Uh, one item as we, there's a lot of equipment that we're going to need to stage at Jeanette's Pier in preparation. Uh, so we're working with Jeanette's Pier to, to fence off a small area in the parking lot so we can provide safety and security as for some of that equipment that we stage. And obviously we'll take that, that fencing as we demobilize as soon as the event's over. And then uh, I mentioned last uh, year that we were selected by the Department of Energy uh, to be a national marine renewable energy center so this was great news for our program and it makes us part of a consortium of universities um, called the atlantic marine energy center so working with the university of new hampshire lehigh university and stony brook university and coastal studies institute it's going to provide funding to help advance our research and our testing programs um, here at Jeanette's pier so we're really excited about that also i think it'll provide opportunities for us to host events here in dare county where we can uh, bring researchers and collaborate um, here in the future. So yeah, I'm excited about that. And then uh, I really appreciate uh, NAG's head being part of this uh, program called ETIP Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Project. It's a long, long acronym uh, name there, typical government. Uh, but this program is fo focused on providing energy resilience for small coastal communities and island communities. And it was just started last year. There's 10 communities that apply or are participating in this first year and Nags Hill is one of the 10 communities. And these communities are from Alaska to Hawaii to Maine. And um, you know, I grew up on, on Roanoke Island and spent my 30 years in the Coast Guard living on coastal communities and islands. And um, you know, we're usually the first ones to lose power and the last ones to get it back <laughs> on. So I'm excited about <laughs> this program, how we can help coastal communities uh, improve their energy resilience. And I really appreciate Nags Hill being part of this first cohort of communities, and I think it's gonna help other coastal communities down the road as we learn lessons learned and how we can build on this program moving forward. And then lastly, I just wanna mention, uh, we have an annual North Carolina Renewable Ocean Energy Challenge that we host at, at CSI, and we weren't able to have it in person the last two years because of COVID, but we're able to have it again this year in person. It's the 30th of April. And uh, it's for my middle school and high school kids. I'm uh, really focused on inspiring that next generation of innovators. And it's a hands-on event. And uh, so please encourage folks to, to look into it, um, um, participate, and um, a great opportunity. So with that, thank you. And just open up for any questions. Before you get away, is that an all-day event? Is there a time to um, that as well? I think if I can get more information on the times. It's pretty much an all-day event. I mean, it's at least two thirds of a day. Okay, yeah. all right, very good. I'd love to see that. So start, Bob, any questions or comments? No, I don't think, I think you covered it pretty well. I don't have any questions. I'm really excited about this project you guys are working on and excited the town's involved in it. It's, yeah. Yeah, this is this yeah. really good. And we're hoping it's gonna bring some VIPs to, to Nags here for the kickoff events and we'll keep you guys in the loop as moving forward with the, those, those events. Yeah, please do, yeah. please do, yeah. Thank you. No questions, but thank you for your presentation. Again, look forward to uh, the events that you have there. And again, you're, you're kind of putting an accent on the map again. <laughs> and uh, just thank you for your work at CSI. Thanks. Right. No, thank you. I'm really excited about the competition that's going to start at the end of this month. Um, we're already in March. I can't hardly believe it. Yeah. But um, we've been hearing about it from John McCord for over a year or more. But I think it's really exciting. Um, we're going to be able to see a lot of great innovative designs, I think. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It, this is a, is a really nice collaboration. It's you know we have so many great assets here with Coastal Studies Institute, uh, with the, with Pier um, slash Aquarium, and uh, and then all the wonderful natural resources. And it's a it's a great place to be on the cutting edge. And so it's real exciting uh, what you're doing. We appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. 
Uh, the next item on our agenda is public comment, and I will turn this over to Mr. Lighty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Every month, the Board of Commissioners welcomes members of the public to provide comment to the board. This is an opportunity for people to provide comments and commentary and regarding matters of interest and concern. It is not an opportunity for dialogue, and the board rarely responds to public comment. But anybody who wishes to provide comment, if you will please uh, approach the podium, start by telling us your name and where you live, and then address your comments to the full board. I will also be keeping the time, and I'll let you know when your five minutes is up. Also, if you're here to speak on the public hearing that we're having uh, later on the agenda, you can reserve your comments until then. Good morning, Mayor Cahoon and all of the commissioners. I'm really pleased to be here. My name is Rosemary Rollins, and I am presenting the League of Women Voters 2022 Citizen's Guide to all of you. Um, this complimentary copies of the guide published by the League since 1988 are distributed annually to government and all kinds of offices throughout Dare County. It contains contact information for local, state, and national agencies, <coughs> voting information, emergency numbers, and a great deal more. Our guide is published under the auspices of the State League of Women Voters Citizens Education Foundation. On the back cover, you'll find acknowledgments of municipalities who have local businesses that donated generously toward the publication expenses. Thank you and thanks to all the staff members who helped us update this information uh, for this year's version. It changes every year and when I delivered it to the fire department, they were so excited because they said, these are all the numbers nobody wants you to get. <laughs> The League members are now distributing 6,600 copies of the guide from Duck to Hatteras Village, Roanoke Island to Mainland Dare. You'll find them in libraries, post offices, the Bomb and Fessenden centers, as well as town and county offices. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Publishing this guide is part of our continued commitment to provide pertinent information to voters. Membership in the League is open to anyone of voting age, male or female. Students 16 and older may join free, even adult students, and new members are always welcome. Thank you so much for your support, and we know you'll enjoy it and find this guide very useful. And uh, it was really interesting for me to be at this first meeting because uh, all the movers and shakers of Naxhead are here, and I love living in Naxhead. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Don Williams. My main residence is in Plymouth, but my heart is in Naxhead. My wife and I are retired. We come down here for the winter. We've owned a property for 25 years. I want to thank you for Naxhead. It's, it's a wonderful place, it's managed well. I'm here today specifically to hear about the decentralized wastewater program. Uh, I am the president of the Herring Ponds Watershed Association. Uh, we are cursed for the last two summers with cyanobacteria blooms, and I'm interested in finding out from your people how they're handling wastewater treatment uh, I've reached out to Kate Jones, and we are going to meet sometime after this meeting. Kate advised me to come and hear the presentation first, and that's why I'm here. But thank you. Uh, Nags Head is my favorite place in the whole world, and we've been a lot of places. It's a place to get your head together. It's a place for community, and it's really well run, uh, as opposed to Plymouth, Massachusetts, which is not. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Williams. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you meant Plymouth, North Carolina. Uh, so did I. <laughs> <laughs> My accent. I <laughs> it sounds like Plymouth, North Carolina. Oh, thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, I believe that closes. We have, we have one more. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Bob. My name is Bob Muller. I'm a resident of Nags Head. Thank you all for your service. I thought I would bring you a report from the trenches. Literally, last week there was a three-foot trench in front of my house. Uh, if I give you a report on the Naxhead Cove waterline project from a resident perspective, uh, and the communication has been outstanding from the town. Dave Ryan has done a really, really good job, starting with a letter that was sent, I guess back in December, a meeting that was held in January, emails that have continued through that. Um, 
my house was on the first strip of the good old Cove Road, Danube to old, Danube up old Cove Road to 158, sort of as a first section, and they have really done a, a, a very good job. The crews doing the job have been friendly and considerate, given the fact that they're blocking your driveway and blocking your street and all that. They've, they've done an outstanding job. We learned yesterday with, I didn't see David, although I think he came by the house, um, that left park across the street for a couple days while they fixed the driveway. They're doing that now. The cuts look really good. Anyway, the project is going really well and the town is doing an outstanding job of mitigating impacts for property owners and, and keeping folks involved. So thank you to them and thank you to you guys for, for making them do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muller. Um, good morning to the con uh, town um, council of Next Head, Mayor Cahoon, and citizens of the town of the Next Head. My name is Victoria Falaleva, and I am here today representing the Ukrainian community in Outbanks. I have been a member of Outbanks community since 2015. Um, citizens of Outbanks are amazing, they're kind, helpful, and I really feel blessed to live here. I would like to take this opportunity to address you regarding, regarding a very important issue. It was an attack of Ukraine by Russian military. I was born and raised in Ukraine. Last Wednesday at 5 a.m., my country was a Russian president, but he declared war with my homeland. Um, it is almost 10 a.m. here, which means 5 p.m. in Ukraine, and it is se seventh day of war. Um, seventh day of war means seven day of bomb shelling, uh, hiding in shelters, losing loved ones, desperately trying to protect our kids, women, some regions even starving. My family lives in Kiev. Uh, it is the capital, and as of right now, it is the biggest target in future. Um, some citizens of Kiev are able to get to railway station and escape, but um, eastern part is pretty much cut off because of the bridges. They're closed in order to protect the right side of the town. So my family is in eastern side and they cannot escape from this war right, as of right now. The Ukrainian community in the United States is buying a huge amount of supplies, such as medicine, warm clothing, hygiene products, item, the items that troops might need on the field. Uh, we send all those packages to Chicago where they will um, pack it in cargo plane and it will be shipped to Poland where they will pass it through the border. We also created a GoFund page with my uh, other bank's friends that are from Ukraine. Um, it should be approved within another few days and um, there is also Ukrainian official website that is called Come Back Alive. Uh, all the money raised will go directly to purchase ammunition, medical supplies, um, food, and, and other humanitarian supplies that needed to people for people to survive. Um, we are assuring that this fundraising effort will be kept transparent and all raised money will go the, to the intended recipients. A huge amount of US citizens messaged me, called me, they were asking how to donate, how to help our military. And our military right now is fighting one of the biggest military, the most powerful military in the world. Russian military is very known to be very strong. Uh, please help our global neighbors and your own neighbors as there is a significant community of Ukrainians not, now living here and we all have families that are in conflict region. Please sign petition online to NATO to close the Ukrainian sky because it really can save human lives, human innocent lives that are peaceful and they just want to stop this war. I appreciate your time and attention to this matter. The Japanese writer Satoru said, individually we are a drop, together we are an ocean. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vic Victoria. <laughs> would, would you please leave the contact information for that relief effort with the town clerk, Ms. Absolutely. Morris? Absolutely, sure will. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Questions? Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. 
Is there anybody else who wishes to make public comment? If not, we will conclude the public comment session at this time. Thank you, Mr. Leidy. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the consent agenda, which you have before you, and a, uh, a motion would be in order. Motion to approve is presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, Next item on our agenda is a uh, public hearing to consider a text amendment, amendment to the uh, flood damage prevention ordinance. I will turn this again over to Mr. Leidy along with Planning Director Kelly Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At this time, we will begin the public hearing to consider the text amendment to the flood damage prevention ordinance uh, designed to address an inconsistency in the application of the regulatory flood protection elevation based upon a property's location east or west of NC-12 in the vicinity of the Nags Head Village Beach Club. Um, we'll begin with the presentation of the staff's analysis provided by Planning Director Kelly Wyatt. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I apologize. That was really emotional. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so uh, just jumping <clears throat> in here with this, and I can kind of walk you through. Uh, but staff was before this board at their January meeting um, to discuss a, a recent variance that was granted by the Board of Adjustment to the town's floodplain damage prevention ordinance. Um, and as part of that, uh, the Board of Adjustment had heard a case where a gentleman was seeking a ground floor enclosure um, in the area of uh, the village at Nags Head on uh, Sandcastle Court. And as part of that review, the Board of Adjustment had identified um, that this property and the surrounding properties were uh, likely at a disadvantage just because of the geography in that area uh, where NC-12 sort of took a jog westward as part of the uh, road relocation many years ago. Um, so probably the easiest way to look at this uh, is through these um, GIS aerials. Uh, you can especially see on this one, this is the area that we're discussing where um, the NC-12 jogs to the west. And as you know, um, our local elevation standards standard is based upon um, the location of your property either east or west of NC-12. So in this instance, these properties were being regulated to a VE-12 in terms of um, FEMA requirements. But uh, realistically, had this road not uh, taken this curve, these properties located in this pocket uh, would actually be regulated to the AE9. Um, so when we talked about this uh, with the board back in January, it was recommended that staff explore some language um, to um, fix the inconsistency that occurred when we applied this geographically. So with that, staff did provide some draft language. Um, it's to both the definitions uh, within the UDO um, as well as the uh, portion of the flood damage prevention ordinance that speaks specifically to uh, the RFPE of AE9 and VE12. So I can scroll down to the actual language, which is gonna be um, where we wanna start. So the first thing we have is the Appendix A, the definitions. Here we have uh, the coastal high hazard areas and we're noting which areas are considered VE12 and which areas are considered AE9. So we're gonna propose to add some language here that says within the village of Nags Head, only parcels with direct frontage on the Atlantic Ocean or Ocean Beach shall be considered a coastal high hazard area with an RFPE of 12. Um, additionally, this is provided in section 11.42. Like I said, this is where we establish the LES. So that same language would just be replicated here for consistency um, to note that uh, this area typically would be considered a VE 12. Um, however, because of its location within the village, um, and because of the properties having direct access to the ocean beach, um, that those would be regulated differently. Um, those with direct access would be VE12, 
those that do not have direct access would be considered AE9. Um, so we presented this to the planning board at their uh, January meeting and they voted unanimously to recommend adoption of it. Um, and I apologize, I, I'm realizing now I should probably have some GIS up so you can see that the way it's outlined, if you take this in the village only, it genuinely is just those parcels where you have the road and the cul-de-sac. So really only the parcels that branch off of that cul-de-sac have direct access to the ocean beach. Those that aren't located off the cul-de-sac um, because they do not have direct access would be considered AE9 instead of the VE12. Um, if you would like, we can, we can probably pull up some GIS to look at the village in totality. But otherwise, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, does the board have any questions for Ms. Wyatt? I don't see any facts. Lots, lots of memories. <laughs> I said, what, what's the average elevation back above 10 feet or? Um, for the ocean front? No, plots? for the. Um, they, they actually are around nine. Okay. Yeah, most of those properties are right at nine. So for instance, um, the gentleman that was seeking the variance um, from the Board of Adjustment, under an AE9, if we were regulating that portion as an AE9, he would not have required a variance to accomplish what he needed to do. Um, so those, those properties are, are around the nine foot elevation. Other questions for Ms. Wyatt? If not, um, Kelly, is there any other information you wish to present regarding this uh, proposed text amendment? No, sir. Does the board wish to receive any other information regarding this from staff at this time? If not, is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on this proposed text amendment? All right. If not, we will now conclude the public hearing and the board may begin its deliberations on this proposed text amendment. I would point out that if the board is inclined to adopt it, you do need to uh, make reference to the uh, consistency statement, which is attached as Appendix A to Ms. Wyatt's report. Thank you. I'll start at this end. Commissioner Cahoon, any questions, observations? No, I think this is really justified. Um, I did read the Board of Adjustments material on this just to inform everybody um, and I think it makes sense what is being proposed mm -hmm. okay thank you Commissioner Brinkley it, it makes sense so. yeah <laughs> thank you Bob I have nothing further okay thank you yeah it, it is a seemingly a fairly straightforward response to a quirky problem so uh, thank you to staff for recommending that and, and so if there's uh, no further discussion, or even if there is, uh, at least at this point, we can have a motion. Make a motion to adopt the ordinance changes as presented, as well as the consistency statement as presented. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I think we could probably go a few more items before we take a break uh, here. We've been at it not quite an hour. Um, so we will continue. Um, uh, Kelly will keep you at the podium there and move into item G, uh, reports, your reports. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, this shouldn't be too lengthy. Uh, first thing that I would just point out um, is that at our previous planning board meeting, which we had back on February 15th, um, they did receive a presentation on the draft decentralized wastewater management plan um, from Holly Miller with Tetra Tech. You'll be receiving a presentation today as well. Um, they did hear a request for zoning map amendment, which was initiated um, by the town for the purpose of uh, rezoning the property where the water plant is located um, on the north end of town. That's currently an SED 80. Um, it is surrounded by C3 and other uh, municipal facilities. So uh, they did hear uh, that request. They um, 
they did vote unanimously to recommend approval of that. So that was on your consent agenda today. Uh, so with the approval of that, staff will begin moving forward with the um, notification and advertisement requirements that are associated with the rezoning. Um, Planning Board received some updates on our uh, Resilient Coastal Communities Program as well as the EV Action Plan. Uh, the Board of Adjustment uh, did not meet in February. We, we went for like eight months with BOA meetings consistently and now we've had two months without one. So, um, getting a little break there. Uh, the first item we have is the Decentralized Wastewater Plan. Uh, like we noted, Holly Miller with Tetra Tech We'll be providing that update to you um, here shortly. Uh, estuarine management plan, there is an advisory committee meeting for that coming up on March 7th. Uh, the Camel land use plan has been received by coastal management. We're in our 45 day review period, so I imagine we'll be hearing from that shortly. Um, with our uh, resilient coastal communities program, uh, we just note that uh, Candace Andre, our consultant, has been working closely with the planning board um, to, to put together some surveys and establish some goals um, where, where that's involved. Also, the uh, planning department and planning staff is engaged um, in a new initiative called Soul Smart. Um, and this is a process where <coughs> we're um, looking into what type of uh, recognition is out there for solar energy technology. I, I believe they've done an initial assessment of our codes and um, we already rank pretty high um, with how we're treating uh, solar energy opportunities. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, our EV action plan, uh, really what's coming out of that is um, that plan is anticipated to be uh, ready for the board to review by May. Uh, we just heard George Bonner speak to the ETIP program. Um, the other thing coming up tomorrow, like we noted, was the Whalebone Park Phase One planning. Uh, that's going to be a uh, public hearing open to the public uh, here in the boardroom from 4.30 to 7 o'clock. And um, please come. Everyone's welcome to come and express their uh, recommendations and suggestions. Um, that's primarily the bulk of it. I did have in here uh, the Dominion LED Amber Streetlight Pilot Project. Uh, we do have those eight beach accesses that have those amber lights. And um, where we're at now is trying to determine um, which one of those street lights. There's, a, I think, approximately three different fixtures among those eight accesses. Uh, trying to determine uh, which fixture we prefer so that moving forward, anytime Dominion is replacing those lights at our beach accesses, they know which fixture that the town would, would prefer to have out there. Um, so if you get a chance, go check those out and uh, let us know um, which fixture you prefer and, and why. That would be great. And uh, lastly, we just got our update from Paige Griffin on the Dowdy Park Farmers Market and um, upcoming events there. So. That is really all that I have for you for the director's report, and I can answer any questions that you might have. Sure. Anyone have questions for the director this morning? Commissioner Cahoon? One. Uh, it's not a question, it's a request. Um, the lights that are put out by Dominion at the b different beach accesses? Yes. Would you um, try to work with Roberta perhaps and get those on our website so that citizens can perhaps go to those websites, I mean, go to those sites physically and see which lights they um, prefer? Perhaps Absolutely. As well. Sure. Um, I know we're our goal is to be turtle friendly and environmentally friendly, but as well as what kind of fixtures. So. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Good Thank request. You. Thank you. Could we get a list of those accesses again? Sure. <laughs> yes. Um, we can forward you an email. It's got the accesses as well as the actual cut sheets for the fixture. So we'll get that out to you today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, all right. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, Thank uh, you. Director Wyatt. Appreciate that. Um, and we will continue with um, a contract request, and that will be uh, Director Wyatt and David Ryan. Uh, 
Okay, total transparency here. When it comes to the grant, I'm going to call for David Ryan to help me with that information. I can handle the site plan, so we can run through that first um, and then discuss the grant information okay. um, if you're comfortable with that. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, so this, uh, this is a site plan review for the Epstein Street Beach Access and Bathhouse. Um, we're looking at construction of a two-story, 1,795 square foot bathhouse, um, pilings, turfstone parking. Uh, there is on-site stormwater management uh, with some decking and shower facilities out there. Uh, the address for this is 4701 South Virginia Dare Trail. It is located in the Village uh, Recreation District. Um, so this property is uh, obviously east of NC-12, so we have a, v, uh, a VE-12 uh, flood standard uh, local elevation to meet here. The first floor elevation is proposed at 13.8, so uh, we would be compliant there. Um, moving through some specifics on the use, uh, it is a permitted use in the village uh, recreation district. Um, because this is redevelopment of the site, um, law coverage remains compliant. Uh, height, you can go to 35 feet. This structure is going to be coming in um, at less than 25, so uh, the proposed structure would be compliant with height. Uh, the structure is also compliant with our architectural design standards. Um, it, there's a requirement that uh, that the structure obtain 150 architectural design um, points through the residential design manual, and um, they have achieved in excess of those 150 points. So uh, the structure being proposed is architecturally compliant. Uh, for beach accesses and bathhouses, we don't have a parking standard, um, but we do have 44 spaces out there, so um, that, that should be adequate. Um, of those 44 spaces, um, many of those, all of those actually, I believe, are in turf stone. So we are um, over our 20% requirement for um, semi-pervious surfaces out there. <clears throat> we will have the required five-foot uh, landscape buffer along the perimeter of this site. Um, so that will have to be installed um, after construction, but before any occupancy permits are issued. Um, and there's no change in the lighting being proposed at this time, but obviously before uh, we do final zoning or issue any occupancy, we'll do a light audit just to make sure it's all compliant. Um, any signage out there will be town and camera uh, compliant as well. Uh, the um, health department, Dare County Health Department, has reviewed and approved uh, the wastewater, stormwater management, as well as traffic circulation. Um, has been uh, designed by the town engineer um, and is compliant. As always, uh, the project will have to meet the North Carolina Fire Prevention Code. Uh, Public Works has reviewed the plan, finds that it's compliant as well. Um, and we are going to need a CAMA permit for this uh, that's been submitted to DCM, so that's currently under review. Um, based upon our analysis, staff recommends approval of the site plan as it's been presented. Uh, the planning board heard this a while back, to actually. They heard it back in November 2021. And um, there's been no significant changes since that time. Um, and at that time, they did recommend approval of the site plan as it's been presented today. Um, I don't know if you would like, but obviously in your package we have uh, the site plan as well as the elevations. If you have any questions on any of that, I'm happy to answer them. Yes, I think we all received hard copies of those. Okay, um, great. So, so thank you. Um, I'll ask the board if anyone has any questions or comments about site plan. No, all right, thank you. In that thank case, you. a motion would be in order to um, the site plan. So moved. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you. All right. Now to the, the access grant. I'll 
try to fill in as best I can. Okay, thank you, David. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. So uh, included in your packet is the, uh, the access grant uh, for the Epstein Street uh, Beach Bathhouse. And, um, as Kelly had just reviewed uh, the, the site plan that um, because this is a grant, we're, uh, we're gonna need the, the board to approve this resolution to, to move forward. So um, if, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll do the best I can to, to okay. answer. No, that's fine. <clears throat> Thank you. I think that's also pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, what we were expecting. Um, so any questions for David about this or for Kelly? Seeing none, then a motion would be in order. Motion so to move. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. A, a motion from Commissioner uh, Brinkley then. Is there a second? Second. I have a second from Commissioner Cahoon. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Look forward to that. Um, and so we will now move to one of the one of the other big items of the day, which is our presentation of the decentralized wastewater management plan. And I will call on uh, Ms. Shepard and uh, Howie Miller. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, we have Holly Miller from Tetra Tech um, here virtually to give a presentation um, on the update of the plan so far. I also am going to pass out hard copies of um, the plan and um, you will also be provided with access to a virtual copy if you would like to look at that version as well. So I'll give these to you and then Holly Miller, you can get started. Excellent, thanks Kylie. Can you all hear me okay? Thank you. Thank you. Was, was that question whether we could hear her? Yes, yes we can, yes. thank Correct. you. Okay, sorry, thank you. I just wanted to make sure my um, headset, the light went off and I was wondering and making sure it wasn't completely broken. So, um, well, good morning everyone, uh, mayor and commissioners. Thank you for having me um, to present on the Decentralized Wastewater Management and Septic Health Initiative. So as you know, we've been working on this plan for about the, the last year or so, and we're in the final stages. Kylie's passing out the draft to you right now. And what I would like to do today is kind of give you a summary of what that is, uh, kind of a Cliff Notes version, if you would, uh, and what that looks like, some of the additions and the recommendations that are in that plan. And then what I'm gonna ask you all to do is, is thoroughly review that, provide any recommendations, We'll make a revision to that plan and then we will finalize this with those recommendations that you provided and, and submit it to the board for final approval. So I will give you an uh, update of that and just to kind of give you background, um, you know, the, the intent of this plan is to evaluate the overall effectiveness of the decentralized wastewater management plan and septic health initiative. We looked at multiple measures and really expanded the plan where it needed to go in the future as you know, the original plan was from 2005 and hadn't been updated since. So this is a really big endeavor um, and it really connects the relationship between on-site wastewater, stormwater, surface water, and groundwater. So it starts to put all of those pieces really well together. And in the plan too, we wanted to make sure that we recognize Todd Kraft's tireless efforts for his dedication to the septic health initiative we wanted to put a memorandum in there for Todd as, as well as his hard work and dedication to the program. And he did an amazing job with the program and we definitely wanted to recognize that in this as well. So let me get into the meat of the actual decentralized wastewater management plan update. As I mentioned, we integrated a lot of different pieces into this update. We really looked at the the different documents, the different studies that the town has conducted over the last several years, and make sure we integrated those perceptions into this document. We got that feedback from, from stakeholders as well as the community. We had done multiple interviews to make sure that we heard the challenges as well as the potential opportunities to adjust the program maybe to make it better moving forward and integrate new recommendations. And then maybe even the current septic health initiative program elements looking at if they were sufficient or if we needed to adjust them in the future. So we took a lot of the stakeholder and community input and integrated that into the, this plan. And what it did is it started the base 
of, of what that looked like. And we built upon that and had great discussions with staff and advisory committee. They were amazing through this whole entire process. And so we, we took that information from the stakeholder and community input and really pushed it forward. And Bob's gonna talk about that here in just a little bit. In addition, we looked at new vision, mission and goals and objectives and what that looked like moving forward, what this plan could, could be and where it needs to go. So that is also in the plan. Now we also made sure we connected to other existing plans. As I mentioned, septic really hits multiple different avenues. It hits groundwater, it hits surface water and stormwater as well. So we wanted to make sure that we spoke to that in this plan and that we recognize that septic isn't a standalone program, it's multiple facets, kind of like a one water plan, so to speak. So if your septic fails potentially, it could affect multiple areas. So we wanted to recognize that and address that and make sure that we understood how that works in relationship with everything else the town has got going on, with plans, ordinances, as well as, as other projects in the works. In addition, as I mentioned, the septic health initiative, we did a thorough program review. We looked at all of the inspections that were conducted, all of the water quality data analysis, the loans, as well as the, the pump out rates that were conducted over, um, over the last multiple years and, and really figured out what is the average, what is the baseline and is that enough? to really make a difference or is there more? So we evaluated what that looked like and it's all in that plan. We talked about it previously. And so we, we really thought about where could the program go? In addition, working with ECU CSI over the last year, they've been studying groundwater across NAGSED and really dove into what is the septic ground face uh, kind of uh, relationship and is it becoming a problem? Is it okay? And what does that look like uh, for the future? So they, they did a lot of sampling, continuous sampling across um, uh, in north to south along the whole entire section of NAGS that and, and really figured out what that looks like. And groundwater specifically um, is, is gonna be a challenge. And so we, we put in specific recommendations for groundwater to be able to, to help manage that piece of things. In addition, we looked at future conditions. As, as things change in NAGSAT, as they do in a coastal community, we wanted to make sure that this is a living plan. It's not static, but it changes as things change as well. So we made sure we address that in this plan specifically to, to think about sea level rise and different scenarios that go along with that, as well as climate change with higher intensity, maybe shorter duration storms, or even additional hurricanes, nor'easters, and all of those pieces put together and how that does affect septic with flooding at the surface as well as potential groundwater elevations coming up from above. And then lastly, we also looked at potential funding opportunities and what that means for next then. You all do an amazing job at looking for funding as you just mentioned in the previous agenda item, you're going after funding to make things happen. So we wanted to make sure we identified items to help fund this program in the future. And there's a lot of money out there to make that happen. So we, have, we put that in there specifically for the plan. And so I wanted to really dive into the additional septic health initiative programs. And, and what we did is we, we took all that data, as I mentioned previously, and we started to develop SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So not just a number, we're going to go after 500 inspections, but when and how. And I'm going to hand it over to Bob Muller to speak to that a little bit and how the AC came up with those items and where we're headed. So, Bob. Thank you, Holly. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for funding this project. Uh, I've served on the advisory committee. Very briefly, we, the staff uh, and, and the contractor looked at the totals since 2005 uh, on the four elements of this of, of this program looked at the septic tank inspections and found that 350 uh, sorry 3,000 inspections have been done over time average of about 150 a year for the over 3,000 on-site wastewater management systems in, in the town um, there's a $45 septic tank 
pump out credit on the water bill, 423 unique properties have accessed that benefit over time, which is not a particularly large number, again, of the 3,000 uh, homes that are serviced by on-site wastewater. There's a low-interest loan program, cost about, it will generate up to, up to $7,500 at a low interest rate to replace your system. 133 homeowners have accessed that over the years. We're now finding that that amount of money does not cover the full replacement of a system, particularly where fill is needed, as it is in many areas of the town, particularly down in South Nags Head. And finally, there's an educational outreach program that we tried to figure out uh, how effective it was. Um, the stakeholders that we talked to, some of them were aware of it, but a lot of them were not aware of the programs that we had in place. And there's a water quality testing program that I'm not going to address here because it's addressed pretty much in depth in a separate section of the, uh, of the, of the report. We are asking for funding to inspect, to grow the inspection program to 500 homes a year by the year 2007. Increase the septic uh, pump out credit from $45 to 150 again by 2007 so that we get so that we are getting half the cost of a septic tank pump out covered by it. The $45 simply doesn't seem to be enough of an incentive to get folks to really start looking at that. Um, and to increase the septic loan program from 7,500 to 12,000, which again st starts to be much closer to the actual cost, top end cost of installing, uh, putting in fill or putting in uh, mounting systems to improve the performance of systems in areas where they're, where they're needed. Uh, and finally to increase the amount of education that we're doing and to try and vary the ways that we're doing education so we actually start to reach homeowners. And there's a second element uh, that we'd like the board to look at, which is to appoint a committee to investigate a voluntary septic subscription program. Voluntary septic sub subscription program would consist of homeowners enrolling in a program where the town provided some le a specific level of service, which could include a free annual inspection, a pump out that was covered by it and possibly access to additional loans and grants to replace the system. Why do that? Um, we believe that there's an opportunity that one of the reasons why folks aren't doing it is simply <coughs> inertia. They don't, they're not thinking about their septic tank. It's, they're not taking care and so therefore they're not taking care of it. By creating a septic, a septic subscription program with a, with a fee that would help cover, help cover some of the cost, you could put that on automatic pilot. You could put that oil change for their septic system on a, on, on a simple basis where they no longer have to think about it. The town or the subscription program, you know, it's organized, um, could take care of it. So I'll tell you, we will also create a model that other towns could replicate. One of the challenges facing the town of Maxit is no matter how well its wastewater management systems uh, perform, if the other towns in the county don't uh, join us in starting to address this issue, it's not going to matter. It's failed systems and problems, but those systems will create the water quality issues that we're fighting. The town has worked so hard to prevent. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Holly. Excellent. Thanks so much, Bob. So as Bob mentioned, you know, the program is multifaceted. And a, a big piece of that is the water quality and bacteria testing. We heard in the public hearing earlier, uh, a citizen was was concerned about that. And so the town is is testing uh, throughout the year for uh, nitrogen, uh, total phosphorus, as well as uh, bacteria. And so we evaluated all of that data and we determined areas that that had higher spikes. And I had showed you graphics, I believe before, of box plots and, and different um, maps that really focused on what that looks like. And I'm gonna show you one here in just a second. But um, that really showed uh, where there's potential issues. And, and issues could be, as Bob mentioned, people aren't maintaining their systems, or the systems are older. And because it's underground, you don't know if there's a problem necessarily. Or if, if there's a groundwater issue, if groundwater is coming up into the, the uh, leach field or the drain field, it could have a direct effluent into groundwater, which eventually could get to surface water. And that's where we're potentially seeing some of these issues, some of these problems. So, so with all of that evaluation, we thought of processes that might help identify some of those potential failures or water quality issues 
maybe a little bit more, more quickly, so then you can backtrack and figure out where you need to target specific areas for education and outreach, or if there is a major problem, if there's a, a group of homes potentially that has a, a failure or even just maybe even a single home, can you, can you directly help that, that single homeowner or group of homeowners and, and figure out a different solution? If it's, if it's septic or if it's raised beds or decentralized wastewater where you're clustering some of the homes together, if, if regular conventional or advanced treatment isn't even possible. So with water quality and, and bacteria, really what, what needs to happen is the data needs to be a little bit maybe more consistent and have a bigger spread. So there, there are um, multiple locations across Nagside, which is great, but we wanted to focus that into areas that we identified as maybe a higher priority. In addition, uh, we would look, like to look at uh, having water quality testing throughout the year. Uh, it's, it's only a certain portion of the year and really focus on nitrate nitrogen. So as opposed to total phosphorus and nitrate. And what that means is nitrate nitrogen is a key indicator for septic failures typically. And, and that, what that is, is it can focus the town's efforts to sampling one uh, parameter for water quality. And that can actually help with some funding as well. In addition, we would like to uh, propose looking at bacteria testing uh, weekly throughout the year and focus on enterococci versus enterococci or E. coli um, or fecal coliform. And, and the reason for enterococci focus is that's what beach closer, closures are, are uh, using for indicators uh, for, for fecal um, or uh, contaminants, bacteria contaminants in the water. So we want to just kind of align the program with that particular parameter to make sure we're kind of speaking the same language. In addition, as I mentioned, the, the map um, is a little spread out. So we identified a couple additional areas to have additional water quality testing that have a low mean sea elevation. And, and we're, we are seeing that a low mean sea elevation or areas between the highways have a higher probability of potential uh, failure or ground face interaction with the uh, drainage uh, in the the leach field um, because the groundwater tables are usually higher in those areas. So additional locations would be Jockey's Ridge, um, just to the south of Jockey's Ridge on Soundside Road, Huron Street, Hargo Street at the beach access for, uh, for convenience as well as safety, East Hunter, East Surfside, and Colony Drive. So it's kind of a, a couple areas on I guess the maybe middle slash north of town and then a large portion of the additional sampling in uh, South Nagset. In addition, uh, we would like to recommend to purchase six remote water quality data loggers. And, and what that means is, as opposed to staff going out and collecting water quality sampling, these remote loggers could do that for you and give you real time data. So it's a quick um, and easy way to, to get data um, that can have, give you more statistics and you can identify problems quicker. And then you can identify solutions quicker as well. In addition, um, because the data was so large, we, we received a huge data file from 2005 to 2021, basically. Um, we recommended that the data be analyzed annually, annually, excuse me, just to make sure that it's, it's being kept up. And then what, what can happen is you can start to get averages for the year, and you can determine if it's a seasonal issue or, um, or if it's a, a, correlates to precipitation or tides, that kind of thing. And then you can figure out what the norm is for, for Nag said. And then that could be your baseline for if nitrate nitrogen, for instance, goes above a certain level, then you could say, yeah, that one is the potential problem. Then you could do further investigation. And here's that map of what that area looks like. The um, circles that aren't filled in are the current sample locations for both surface water sampling and groundwater sampling, and the red are the proposed. So as I mentioned, Jockey's Ridge East, you can see there, and then uh, a large group in Nags Head. And, and the reason for South Nags Head is to really focus on low mean sea elevation in that area and get a better spread of that data. Because there was only two main sample locations in South Nags Head, we were able to really figure out what, what's going on down there and to make sure that we have a, a good idea of the water quality in that location specifically. This is north of, um, north of the highway of 64 
there's a pretty good spread of, of the data. And so, as I mentioned, the groundwater is, is, is challenging for septic. Um, ECU did this, this amazing study, and the, the details of the study are, are, are a couple different things. South Nags had in Bodie Island, as well as Wright Brothers sample locations, they had shallow groundwater tables of less than three and a half feet deep from the surface. The requirements have about two feet of depth for the actual drain field um, pipes. And then um, there's a one and a half foot separation requirement from the bottom of that trench to the groundwater. So that's where your three and a half foot number is coming from. So in those areas, South Nags had Bodie and Wright Brothers, the, the groundwater table was, was shallow. It was, it was either in that three and a half feet location or it was, it was actually in the drain field in the pipes itself. So that was a big challenge and that kind of opened up our eyes to this is a problem and we need to figure out a solution. And, and is it related to groundwater itself? Is it the elevation? Is it a combination of that? And, and what does that look like in the future if groundwater continues to rise? Is that gonna be a problem? So in this plan, we specifically addressed what that could look like and came up with some solutions for that as well. In addition, the study identified uh, the next had municipal building right where you all are, as well as Darty Park had groundwater tables at depths greater than three and a half feet. So those areas were, were good. They were meeting requirements. So you, you could start to see sort of a trend of where potential hotspots were for groundwater. And then in addition, uh, samples were taken at Bonnet Street. Um, they had a deeper groundwater table and in general ECU CSI um, identified oceanfront homes typically had a deeper groundwater tables than sound side in general, um, but there are some uh, areas that, that had some other challenges. And they weren't sampling a, a whole spread of, of data. So the, the data was a little bit sparse. So we're gonna make some recommendations to add additional groundwater sampling locations as well. And then in addition, long-term data, as I mentioned, if you're looking into the future, suggests that groundwater elevations, specifically in Dare County, are rising similar or faster than sea level rise at 0 0.433 inches per year per this study as well as previous data from, from other gauges in the area. And then that could contribute to additional septic systems with less than that one and a half feet of separation between the bottom of the trench and the groundwater table. So it, it definitely is a potential issue for concern. And as I mentioned, we, we try to address it here in the plan. So part of those recommendations is to purchase more remote groundwater data loggers. Because there was only a year worth of data and there weren't a, a big spread of monitoring locations, we really needed to study this a lot more to see if it is truly a problem, if it's seasonal, as I mentioned with water quality, or if, uh, if there's just spots that are potentially having a problem. And those locations were East Admiral, Kitty Hawk Heights for kind of a control, uh, Jockey's Ridge East, similar to the water quality location, the post office, Soundside Road, uh, Jeanette's Pier, Huron Street, Hargrove, uh, at the water tower, and at East Seagull. And here is the map of those additional locations. So the existing groundwater uh, samples are shown in green and the proposed are shown in red, specifically in this map. And it really focused on a couple of main target areas, uh, sound side, um, south of um, Jockey's Ridge, uh, right by Whalebone, south of Whalebone, kind of in that, that piece right there um, by Jeanette's Pier. And then just getting a better spread in South Nags Head, similar to water quality, to, to really figure out is it, is it pockets or is it a, a bigger um, problem than we had anticipated. So that will really help get additional data and really make sure that our assumptions are correct or not correct, and then move forward with the game plan that we have recommended in, in this for management. In addition, with all of that, we also looked at future conditions with sea level rise, precipitation flooding, and those groundwater table elevations that I just talked about. And, and there, there's obviously um, different scenarios, different models that go along with that. And it, you know, we're anticipating 
potential changes, but we're not 100% sure what that looks like quite yet. But in order to be prepared, having a game plan in place is good. Then you can start to make either decisions or have more information to be able to think about what that looks like. So for recommendations for future conditions, we are suggesting to develop a sort of specific next that are maybe Outer Banks climate model. And what that does is it would focus some of the study specifically in Outer Banks versus a North Carolina climate model, which is too broad. Really focus on the Outer Banks and Nags Head and really think about what that could look like in relation to, to septic as well as uh, stormwater and flooding and that kind of thing. Obviously continue to incentivize the installation of stormwater control measures to aid in flood reduction. Flood flooding for septic systems uh, can cause a septic system to fail very easily and installation of a stormwater control measure uh, like a detention pond or um, pervious pavers, uh, bioswales, rain gardens, um, as well as multiple other features can pull water a little bit closer to the source and delay it from running off of the surface. And that actually can change the, the peak and um, it, can, it can help with controlling stormwater runoff and, and kind of keeping it closer to the source and then potentially infiltrating it into the ground um, without raising the groundwater table too much. And then obviously, um, you know, looking at how NAGSCAD can be um, kind of a driver for this. Are there potential opportunities to reduce impervious surface right there at town hall or other town facilities? Obviously that's a large CIP item that would need potentially a grant to make that happen, but that could show that, um, that the town is dedicated to decreasing impervious surface and that could help with uh, septic issues as well. And obviously coordinating with DOT um, on, on the highways with increased carrying capacity. If the roadside ditches aren't big enough, they're not gonna carry the water where it needs to go. Um, obviously uh, installation of potential stormwater control measures in relation to increasing capacity for runoff uh, would need to go hand in hand. And then in addition, as NAGS had grows a little and, and changes, you know, making sure we preserve that open space um, with the correct vegetation, as well as potentially planting additional trees outside of septic systems, uh, really thinking about how those, uh, that vegetation can uptake potentially some of that excess runoff as well as groundwater um, to help with kind of combating some of those different challenges that we're facing. And then in addition, uh, we were looking at um, developing a, a risk assessment for septic and really thinking about that planning guidance, as I mentioned earlier. So we evaluated all parcels within the town of Nags Head and we put a potential risk and that risk was potential for a septic failure. And, and we uh, bucketed them into a low risk site conditions um, that, were, that were effective at treating septic effluent, a medium risk where there was Generally, septic was being um, treated effectively, but there may be some environmental factors that, that might create issues in the future, or um, maybe advanced systems um, could be installed in a location um, to make it better. And then there were also parcels with high risk where site conditions are not currently, or maybe not currently in the future, being favorable to support treatment of septic. And so what that is, is it helps identify parcels or potential areas for the town to focus their efforts on. And that looks like this. So this is all in the plan as well. The green is the low risk, the orange is medium risk, and the high is, is purple. Um, and you can see those purple areas kind of start to show up on uh, sound side as well as South Nags Head and in the causeway as well. And those, those assessments included uh, distance to surface water, distance to stormwater features, um, mean sea elevation, groundwater elevation, and multiple other factors. And that's all in the report as well. In addition to those uh, high risk parcels, we wanted to really focus on what that means for an exit and, and how the town can effectively utilize the data that we have reviewed and obtained and, and start to help with septic. So definitely a targeted outreach and engagement will be needed for some of those high risk parcels. And that could be part of the initial septic health initiative, but it could be also be 
maybe that volunteer program that Bob talked about earlier. Looking at potential advanced levels of septic treatment might be really beneficial for some of those areas and it could really help distance that groundwater separation. Um, looking at state and federal grants uh, related to neighborhood scale septic. So if, if areas, large areas are, are all in high risk, is there a potential to maybe convert a group of homes to a decentralized septic or a cluster system as opposed to individual septic systems? And uh, we definitely wanted to look at uh, identification of areas for future open space. So if you have some preservation, um, there could be a location um, where either a, a treatment could go for a decentralized septic location, or if, if properties are having repetitive losses, is there an opportunity for a buyout potentially and maybe utilizing that space a little bit differently to help with some of these challenges that the septic um, systems are facing. And I, I mentioned earlier, uh, grants and loans. How is this all going to get funded? You know, there's not a magic uh, pot of money somewhere. So there's a lot of grants out there, as I mentioned. There's multiple funding opportunities to support the decentralized wastewater management plan and the septic health initiatives. So um, I'm not sure if y'all are familiar, but the new FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities BRIC grant um, started a couple of years ago. The pot of money was a billion dollars. Um, each state is allocated money from that as sub applicants. And so that, that's a very large pot of money that helps with mitigation, resiliency. And so septic as well as flooding could fall into that pot. Uh, the, the FMA or flood mitigation assistance is also in that same category that can help with buyouts, but it also can help with other things. The HMGP or hazard mitigation grant program is another one, as well as the CDBG community development block grant. Those all kind of fall in that FEMA realm of, of funding. Uh, North Carolina DQ, Division of Water Infrastructure, DWI, has multiple grants that are fairly new that, um, that are going to be addressing potential items just like this. Because septic isn't a, uh, a regular utility necessarily, um, but it is a utility that's needed. Um, it's, it's falling into a different category. We talked to DWI and they were thinking septic could definitely be under that category for potential grant funding. Um, so there's an opportunity there. There's a lot of money coming into DWI from the American Rescue Plan Act as well as infrastructure monies. Um, in addition, um, Department of Water Resources, Water Resources Development Grant, WRDG, has some funding as well to help with more stormwater type projects, but there's potential money there as well. And that's a very easy grant. It was filling out a spreadsheet. So one of my favorites. Um, in addition, uh, DEQ, Land and Water Fund, are starting a new flood grant program. It's new, they're, they're, they haven't even started it yet. So there's some money that's gonna be coming there as well. And then in addition, the Department of Justice Environmental Enhancement Grant or EEG has a pot of money that is from the Smithfield Agreement. There is some funding there also. Among that, there's multiple other grants that are out there um, as well as loans from Clean Water State Revolving Fund uh, and as I mentioned, the Infrastructure Act and American Rescue Plan Act has a lot of money um, for potential projects like this. Obviously, uh, partnerships with universities, nonprofits um, can help with that, uh, as well as matching funds coming in. So in, in summary, in the plan, we recommended specific priorities as well as timing of when to make all these things happen. So within the next year in the plan, we identified to obtain septic system records from Deer County. As I mentioned previously in other presentations to y'all, they're still in paper and um, that, that's a potential problem. Um, so that's definitely something we'll be coordinating with Deer County on, or the town will be coordinating with Deer County on to make sure that um, that is a priority. And that could even come from a potential grant to make that happen. Uh, Deer County is, is being challenged with uh, not having enough staff to get things done. And, it's just not on their priority yet. Um, in addition, uh, really looking at how to provide that information to homeowners. You know, is Dare County their point of contact or should they call, should they call the town for that information? So uh, utilizing a GIS platform and getting that information on there would be really beneficial to get homeowners information that they need 
fairly quickly, especially if you're running into a problem where your septic is failing or has already failed, you don't wanna wait three or four days to make uh, that contact and that information available. So having that available, um, not necessarily fingertips, but very close um, is, is gonna be really beneficial to homeowners to make adjustments and, and try to get things fixed if they need to. In addition, um, continue to building, uh, build and update the septic health initiative database. We created a, a, a template for an Excel database. We input a lot of data into that. And just as, as new building permits come in that have a septic component to them, updating that within the Excel database will help that information carry forward. In addition, uh, the Dare County information, if that all could be pulled into that database, um, that, would be, that would be wonderful as well. As Bob mentioned, uh, the voluntary septic system, uh, developing a committee to really flush out that program. The idea is, is gonna be really beneficial. We heard from stakeholders as well as the community that they just don't think about septic. It's the last thing on their mind. So taking that, that burden, that worry off of homeowners and having them uh, pay into a program where they can have someone help them make that happen and then improve our water quality on the back end, that's gonna be a win-win for the town. In addition, I mentioned applying for grants and then focusing that water quality on nitrate nitrogen or NO3 minus and uh, bacteria on entrococci. And then within the next two years, uh, or even maybe sooner depending on funding opportunities, looking at purchasing those remote water loggers, implementing the actual voluntary septic subscription service, um, providing additional education through those high risk areas, developing additional fact sheets and YouTube videos and that kind of thing to really make septic more the forefront. People don't want to talk about septic because it's kind of a weird topic to talk about. But I think if we start having those conversations, uh, people are going to get uh, more thoughtful about some of their actions. Internally, when we've been talking about septic, we're thinking about it all the time right now. And that's not something that was done previously. So I think it sparked change in us internally. And I think if we can project that out to residents, they're gonna do the same thing. In addition, it really look at expanding timing of the pump out program. Uh, it is done uh, throughout the year. We heard that homeowners would really like to see um, potentially having that done now. So in the off season, when homeowners um, aren't renting out their facilities, um, it might affect uh, year-round residents or people who come down for the winter, but having it done this time of year is, is good preparation for both the inspection and the pump out in, in preparation for that spring season coming up. And really looking at um, uh, meeting those goals. I think meeting those goals will be more effective in, in the off season now. You could probably catch a lot more people and try to reach those numbers that we talked about. And then a, a couple more slides here within the next two years, looking at GPS locating potentially septic systems. Right now, you get a paper map and you gotta kind of figure it out yourself. So if we could have a, a little bit more technology involved in that and try to get a GPS locate on that, it'll be a lot easier to be able to find those systems and then figure out how to fix them. As Bob mentioned, setting a goal of completing 500 septic system inspections annually by 2027. And that's a step up process from the average about 150. So it's, it's not jumping from 150 inspections now to 500 next year. So it's a slow progress to try to maybe hit that goal of really looking at uh, a bigger portion of, of the systems in, in town. And then in addition, looking at 250 or half of those inspections to maybe have a pump out if it's warranted by 2027 as well. And then Bob mentioned increasing the septic system pump out rebate we talked to um, inspectors that are looking at septic all the time, as well as understanding the, the pump out costs. And that, those costs are about $300. So uh, $45 might not be worth it for people to, to put in their receipt to get that rebate back. But $150 might make people really conceive, consider that. And it might be a good incentive to get people to do it. And then lastly, within the next five years, uh, going to get those water quality monitoring um, loggers, as well as adding additional stations, uh, the bacteria testing in addition to water quality testing, increasing that number, identifying those high water users. High water use can also lead to potential septic failures if it's a running toilet, can actually fail a septic system. 
So really looking at potential leaks and flagging those and being able to notify the homeowner, I think you have a leak, you might wanna to try to get it fixed, otherwise your septic could fail. You know, kind of getting that communication going. And then in addition to future actions, as I mentioned, uh, looking at a, even a potential septic utility, in addition to everything else, doing a study to see if that is warranted. Uh, developing a, a regional climate model, as I mentioned previously, to figure out what that looks like from a risk perspective, and then uh, looking at future conditions from a viability and using the climate model to develop a, a, a much greater master plan than even this plan has covered. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Just a final note, um, the draft comments uh, will be received through August 6th. So take a look at the documents that Kylie has passed out, as well as if you wanna look at the online uh, digital version. Uh, we'll be presenting a, a more formal reading at the August, excuse me, April 6th Board of Commissioner meeting, and then we'll be finalizing the document and uh, we'll be requesting approval on May 4th. So with that, if you all have any questions, I would love to answer them. Okay. Th thank you very much uh, for that presentation uh, from, all, from all of you who were engaged. Um, before I turn it over to the, the board members for, for questions, um, I, I have perhaps more of an observation than a, than a question. Um, I appreciate the robustness, the depth with which this is being done in the town of Nags Head. Um, I sit here and wonder why this isn't a countywide effort to explore <laughs> these issues because we know that they, uh, both the problems and the potential problems are worse. Um, certainly all around us, equal or worse, all around us, um, and all of the water is connected, so you don't stop these problems from going from one place to another. Um, nonetheless, I appreciate the fact that we're doing it, uh, it you know, and I guess that leads to a, um, a, a concern, um, which is that um, we need to do what we can to protect uh, groundwater and um, the, the open waters around the town. Um, but I could foresee that what we would be doing, we would be um, creating mitigations and incentives uh, because the permitting agency over which we don't have control has neither interest or uh, capacity in modifying the way systems are permitted. And uh, I don't suppose that there's a ton that we can do about that. Um, so I can speak to that just a little bit. We had a great interview with Dare County. They were applauding the program as well as the state. And I, and I think maybe moving forward, there could be um, additional communication with them on obviously this plan as well as, as what that looks like or for NAGSAT as well as the whole entire county, like you said, the, that the water doesn't stop at, at the town line. So uh, really thinking about this plan is, is kind of a model for everyone else in, in the Outer Banks really, is gonna be really beneficial. And in Deer County, they recognized their um, potential um, issues. And I, I think they just need that little bit of help. So uh, potentially applying for grants or, or other funding might be able to get them there or hiring out um, services to help scan those documents and get them into a, a format that's usable is going to be really beneficial and obviously the permitting in the in this particular document we didn't recommend um, taking over the program from Deer county obviously but um, looking at how maybe advanced systems could help with better filtration of effluent so you do have better water quality and you're protecting uh, uh, both surface water as well as uh, ocean and sound side Thank you. We have uh, Mr. Moore at the podium. Ben, yes, sir. I, there is interest in this, both in the report and in the program from other local governments in the in the area, and I could foresee where staff and might be invited to do a brief presentation on what we're doing, but what we found in the report, some of which is a little scary, mm -hmm. uh, and what we're doing and what other towns might be able to other local governments might be able to do. Uh, I'm thinking municipalities, and if the town were invited to present to the county, um, I think I think they will surely would be happy. I'm sure would be happy to go. 
there, this doesn't have to just be for Mag Said. Mm -hmm. This is a platform that can be used to spread <coughs> the gospel of decentralized mm -hmm. wastewater management across across the, across the county. And I, and I hope that the town will pursue uh, opportunities yeah, to good, do that. Good. Thank you. I, I, I would like at some point to have a sort of elevator version of this that I could take to the mayors, uh, the monthly mayors and uh, county board chairs meeting as well and um, make sure that they're aware of what we're doing. So, Commissioner Cahoon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a great project, been supportive of septic health for a long time. Um, I guess some of my biggest frustration is not with our county health department, but when they've turned down septic permits on the ocean front and the state overrules them and puts the septic tanks out there anyway, when there's no, when they're not 50 feet away from the water line. Um, so that to me is a problem, um, not just here, but all throughout the county. Um, issuance of septic tank permits that should not be getting them. But I think the program is good. I think we've got a lot of work to do um, to evaluate and we've got a lot of work to do as it relates to budgetary impacts too. Yep. That's what the program is so. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Brinkley. I'd like to thank Bob and the other committee members for their work uh, on this project, Callie and other staff members, as well as uh, Holly with Tetra Tech. You know, when you talk about septic, some people, much like they said, may not get excited <laughs> about it, but when you read in here under the executive summary, Dare County Environmental Health, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality and North Carolina Department of Health Human Services specifically wished others would follow the town of Nags Head lead and being proactive when it comes to septic systems. A little bit further down, overall, the program is unique and like no other in North Carolina nor the country. And that's us leading the way in this. And it's a lot of good recommendations are coming out of this. And I look forward to seeing how we're going to be able to take this to another level. And much what Bob said, if we're able to get others on board, that would be, that would be a, uh, a big thing. Indeed. Thank you. Okay, Bob? No, I don't have any questions. I think you covered this topic very well. Um, I don't think there is not a person in this room that's uh, excited and really excited about this project. I think it's great um, moving forward and, and I'm excited that the uh, county and the state is also really interested in this as well. And, and like Bob said, I thank everybody for their work. And like you said, uh, I think this can be a model for the other towns to, to adapt and grow on. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have a problem with that as long as you are brief. <laughs> Thank you. Plymouth, Massachusetts and Nags Head are very similar with how close groundwater is and they're also similar with the seasonality of their, their people. I wanna point out to you one of the problems we've had, we're mostly septic, uh, one of the problems we've had is people who move to Plymouth, Massachusetts don't know what septic is about. Mm -hmm. They don't know that they have to maintain it, they don't know that they have to pump it and with, with the number of, of uh, uh, landlords here, and I'm one of them, uh, but I'm on your program, uh, the number of landlords here, that, that could be even worse. So I, I, I think that the education portion of this is going to be uh, disproportionately more important for you and for us. Yes, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that observation. Yes, correct. Commissioner. There's yes. a lot of people that move here that don't have a clue that they're on a septic system. They don't even know what a septic system is. Right. Um, the people that move into the village, they're fine, but overall people do not understand what septic systems are. That's right. So education is a big deal. It, it, it will be indeed. That's what, the, uh, that's what the inspections are supposed to cover, correct? The increase of that the definitely inspection. helps with the education piece, but you have to make that phone call. So I think having other resources outside of that, there's, if you Google septic, YouTube videos, you're gonna find out a lot of information very quickly and the town could replicate that specifically, brand it with the town of Nag said, and, and that could be a simple, here's how to look at your septic or here's what to look out for, or you know, it, here's how to fix a running toilet so it doesn't overwhelm your septic. So those little PSA videos could easily be done by the town as well as additional handouts and educational tools to capture both people who who have been here for a year long residents, maybe people who come down for the winter or renters even that, that have no clue and, and really thinking about what that looks like. So in the education piece of 
the decentralized wastewater management plan. We spoke to that very specifically and even you know, giving out welcome packets to new residents with information on the program as well as kind of do's and don'ts. And then we talked a lot to um, some of the, the rental agencies of maybe having like a window cling that sticks on a mirror of what not to flush down a, a, a toilet to really think about what that means because of all of these resources. We wanna make sure that they're all pristine and we were really touching on each of them. So those are great, great comments and, and definitely thank you for that. Okay, all right, thank you. Kylie, before you do that, Commissioner Cahoon. Um, a thought process. Our videos that we produce each year um, with the money from GovEd, mm -hmm. I'd like to see us kind of concentrate some of our videos on septic health. That's a good idea. Yep, very good. Kylie? Yeah, um, I just wanted to speak to uh, what Commissioner Sainer said real quick about the inspections and those being education um, opportunities. We do provide the opportunity for homeowners to be present for the inspections um, so that they can walk through that process um, with the inspector. But like Holly Miller said, they have to make that phone call or apply for that inspection first. Um, so there, so education is a big aspect of this. I get a lot of frantic phone calls from new homeowners who just suddenly realize they have a septic system and they're being led by fear. Um, and it's, you know, they calm down once they realize we have this program, we provide education, we provide these opportunities to learn more um, and receive those incentives for taking care of your system. But there is a lot of education that does need to be done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, board, any other comments or questions? Again, thank you all for an excellent presentation. Um, we, we thank you for this work and uh, we look forward to um, probably dealing, dealing with and seeing some of this come budget time uh, over the next couple of years here as we, as we implement uh, some of these recommendations. So thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Right. And if you could just, um, you can send comments to me um, through the rest of the month. Uh, you can email them to me. You can drop off your binders if you have written comments in there. Um, I just want to get those to Holly Miller so we can begin to incorporate um, those comments into the draft. Okay. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and at this point, I know we have another planning item, but I think it's time for a break. And so the board will take a 10-minute recess. Agenda is a discussion of possible expansion of our vegetative sprigging grant program. Kate. Good morning, board uh, members and mayor. Um, I am here today to discuss the potential expansion of the um, cost share program. Um, right now it's known as the Dune Vegetation Cost Share Program. And um, just real quick, I'll go through some facts. Um, as you may remember, we started this program, or it became active last year, um, January 1, 2021. Um, we ended up dispersing about $4,000 in grant money to oceanfront property owners year two, where we currently are. Um, we have um, $6,000, so we've had a little more participation this year, which is great, but when you look at the ratio of what we've allocated and what's being used, I think there could be some more potential for um, upping the amount. So today, um, as, as noted in your memo, an, a potential expansion for this program would be, um, this year especially, something we, we may be able to do right away is to include the installation of sand fence. So moving beyond just vegetation, but property owners would be able to apply for reimbursement for sand fence as well. Um, and really the goal here is to improve flexibility for uh, oceanfront property owners, improve the particip participation rate, and then I think that would also improve the outcomes of the program. So, um, you know, we get a lot of people calling asking why, you know, I, I, what should I do sand fence or vegetation, what should I do? And I really think in discussion with staff that this would provide some more flexibility. 
Um, and again, that, that could up to the recommend, recommended amount would be 1,000 per parcel. It's currently set at 500. And uh, we would open that up to really um, both materials and labor. So again, just, just increasing flexibility. So that would be a potential change for this current program. And then staff um, is recommending that for next year's program in 2022-23, we could um, start implementing a sand relocation cost share program, which um, essentially the idea would be to um, offer assistance to oceanfront property owners. Um, we, we are suggesting the amount of $2,000 max per applicant per parcel. Um, this is looking at the data from this year at the current sand relocation data, looking at the average cost that, that some of these projects are um, charging um, and trying to come up with a number that would be around 50%. This could vary, but based on the data we have thus far, that's where it's coming from. Um, so this would be a recommendation for next year. Um, it would be, I think, smart to align it with our sand relocation program. So the process could be they apply for their sand relocation permit. Um, staff uh, would, would look at that permit as usual, would, would um, you know, make sure it's in line with the, the rules and recommendations. And then once that's approved, they could then apply for the funding. That funding would be available potentially every three years was the, the, um, the time, you know, limitation on that. And um, again, that would run along with the, the current dates of the sand relocation program, uh, November 15th to, I believe the last day to apply is April 15th to apply. You have a couple more weeks to finish the work. So um, staff would, would generally like to get the board's opinion of these suggestions or you know expand, expansions in the programs. Um, what you think about the phasing, how we've suggested to lay this out for the rest of this year and into next year. Also, um, what you think about the amounts that we've suggested for reimbursement, as well as, um, as noted in your memo, uh, recommendation for expanding funding for the program at the amount of $100,000 for the next fiscal year. So hopefully, uh, it's, it's a few things to consider. And if I've missed anything, feel free to, to um, ask me any questions. Um, Andy's here as well. He's was also involved in coming up with a lot of this information um, and answer any questions you might have. Okay. I think I have to start down here. Commissioner Kane. Um, I like the recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, I could see more people using them. I would ask that we also um, not limit it to sand fence, but incorporate the use of hay bales as well. Mm, okay. Um, I'm not a sand fence proponent overall. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. The debris it leaves behind, I think, is dangerous to children and our visitors. Um, so I understand the use of sand fencing. I think it has a, but I think there's an alternative to be used. Okay. So I'd like to see that added into our, okay. make it a little bit more flexible more with that. Flexible. Um, I think the, the changes in it from 500 to 1,000 is probably better as far as allowing it to be used for um, labors and materials as well. Or labor as well, I think. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm happy with the changes. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Brown. Thank you for your work on this and other uh, other staff members. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with Commissioner Cahoon and the use of hay, hay bales. Okay. I think that incorporating that would be really good. I'm also in favor of the uh, increase from the 500 to 1,000, and then the sand relocation. Uh, just hearing comments from people about how much money they spend doing that. Anything that the count town can do to help mitigate some of those costs, I think is, is good. So okay. I'm in favor of what you proposed uh, with the addition of adding the hay bales as yeah. well. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Commissioner Sanders. Yeah, I think it looks good. <laughs> I like it. I do. Um, any, any observations on how the plannings work compared to the sand fence or the hay bales? I think I kind of like the hay bales too, a little less intrusive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about the hay bales is they do biodegrade, um, and yes, you don't. You generally don't have obviously the metal involved and the debris you have when when sand fence gets 
disturbed, which as we know now, as you can see what's on the beach now, there's a lot of it out there. Um, I mean, I think from our observations, you know, if, it, if you're strictly looking at what catches sand more effectively, um, I think just based on observations, it would probably be sand fence. But I mean, you know, to Renee's point, maybe looking at it holistically um, as far as multiple benefits and not just the sand accumulation, you could, you could say either one could be benefit in certain situations. Um, but I think the more, you know, the more flexibility we can bring to this program, the better. So um, the hay bales certainly do work. We've, we've tried some and they did accrete sand. Um, and there may be certain locations they work better than others. Um, in certain locations, the sand fence definitely work better than others. So just, it really is so site specific. Sounds good. Yeah. And, and with all the problems we have, I'm definitely in favor of the sand relocation and helping out with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I have a question about the, about the hay bale installation mm -hmm. because I've thought about this. And I, I, like, I also like the idea of, of using the hand ba hay bales. Um, how are those being, in, when, when we've installed those or when you see those installed, how are they installed? Or essentially, are they, do they build a wall, essentially, a solid wall of hay bales? So they, they, as far as installation goes, they oriented them the same as you would a sand fence panel uh -huh. um, at, at that 45 degree angle at that 10 foot length. And then the spacing is the same as sand fence. So they essentially were installed just like sand fence, if, if that's what you're asking. Um, but but an individual segment uh, oh, of an it, individual it, segment. is it is it that a solid segment essentially of stacked? Yeah, and I bales? believe they were um, they were tied together um, with either a twine or some sort of um, like I think it was a twine and. Um, so they were tied together, and in general, they stood as one, and, and I think there were a few that the little bales had kind of fallen off, but uh -huh. um, most of them, and then, you know, the sand starts accumulating, which kind of holds them right. in place as well. And, and I think Public Works may have, may have used one or two stakes just uh -huh. initially to provide some, some sort of vertical okay. into the sand, which I think is helpful. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, I, no metal. Okay, I, I would be curious about an experiment mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, maybe maybe uh, stack them uh, with some, if you could stack them with openings mm -hmm. in them, uh, spaces between the, in other words, between rather than like a budding bales that, you know, the bottom row maybe had some space in it, the next bale would bridge it and those bales, because the disrupting the airstream mm -hmm. is what causes the sand to drop out. In other words, if you create eddies in the airstream and mm -hmm. the airstream slows down, which it does as it passes between the boards of a fence, those grains drop to the ground because the, the airstream is disrupted. So hay bales will do that generally over the top and around the ends, but not but, through. But not through. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if they were, if there's a way to stack them so that they have space, do we get better, do we get better accretion of sand behind them and around them if and those spaces may fill up with sand i don't know that but i'm just asking the question is is there another way to stack them that might mm -hmm. increase their effectiveness mayor may i make a suggestion yes um figure eight island did <coughs> a test project of hay bales that's mm -hmm. where a lot of this came from my suggestion would be to have kate or somebody in staff contact fig the administrator of figure eight island mm -hmm. um, and talk with yeah. them about how they did their test projects and so forth. Okay. Okay. That would be good. Thank yep. you. Can do that. That was all. That was all I had. Otherwise, y you know, I'm and in that favor. That made a lot of, of sense. I mean, mm -hmm. I could see different configuration in order to allow some airflow and different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And um, it also might increase the amount of fence we can build with the same number of hay bales. <laughs> so and without losing effectiveness. Um, so generally, I'm in favor of the things you propose, the larger items, you know, maybe budget considerations, but, but generally, yes. Yeah, so. Okay. Understood. Thank All right. You. Thank you very much. All right. Thank appreciate, you. Appreciate Appreciate that. Um, the next item on our agenda are uh, we come to new business and committee reports. 
Uh, this is where board members report on any meetings that they've attended. And I'll start down at the other end with Commissioner Sanders. Um, we meet next Monday. So looking forward to that. And there's been a lot of data collected. So we'll, I'll have a report next time. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Commissioner Brinkley. Uh, Jeanette's uh, peer advisory uh, committee. We got an email report from Mr. Remage. And just very briefly, uh, talking about visitation, 2021 ended with the best October they've ever seen, uh, how, followed by a more typical November and December. Overall, 2021 was comparable to pre-pandemic years. Um, the wind turbines are going to be installed, three new ones, uh, in March. Oh, joy. <laughs> I thought about that before I read it. Um, graphic panels that go out uh, along the... Uh, Along the pier, some of them have uh, faded and began failing, so they are showing signs of wear. So the, uh, they've been editing and updating the majority of the panels to make them look a little bit better. And then just doing some other maintenance items. And then he also mentioned the, the drink uh, stage uh, competition that George spoke about earlier. That's it from Jeanette's pier. Okay, very good. Thank you. May I ask Mr. a question? Yes. <laughs> The turbines, are they going to be installed as the same ones that they had before, or are they going to be installed as the ones that were originally presented to the board that we approved in the site plan? I can find out. The, it was very brief. Burgee Wind Power is completing the third party verification process on their electronics and will be installed, you know, and they'll be installed in March. But I can certainly ask about what. Because they were presented to the board and we approved one kind and they installed a different kind. I will ask uh, Mr. Remage about that and get you an answer. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you. Commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, mine is further down under my agenda. Okay. So. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, and I, I'd rather than save it, since it's appropriate here to talk about committee meetings, um, <clears throat> the North Carolina Towers Task Force, the Task Force for Offshore Wind Energy Resource Strategies, um, the purpose of that committee is to uh, uh, work to prepare the essentially the North Carolina economy to be uh, more engaged in offshore wind so that North Carolina is manufacturing and maintaining those resources as they are developed and that work is not lost to other states. <clears throat> and there are a number of large manufacturers interested in, um, in locating in North Carolina. Uh, we we uh, have met once. Um, we will meet again on May the 5th. I am serving on the outreach committee as a co-chair along with Susie Hamilton, who was the former secretary of um, environmental quality. Uh, also a former elected representative uh, from down south. So um, excited about, about that and um, about our uh, next meeting. Uh, that brings us then to uh, item H2, consideration of a resolution to permanently close a portion of 8th Street. Uh, Manager Garman. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item relates to the Public Works Master Plan that we have been working on with the board. Uh, so as the board is aware, we are looking at a site plan that provides a new water distribution shop up towards the water plant on the northern portion of, of our water plant property. Uh, in order to maximize the use of space there and to be able to bring a driveway in along that north lot line, it would be useful for the town to have that portion of the right of way and not have to uh, abide by the setbacks that would be imposed from the lot line. So we have, uh, we're going through a process now to, to consider vacating the right of way of 8th Street we have been in communication with Kill Double Hills, and they have a put this on their agenda for next Monday. And so we're sharing the same resolution and map with them, and they have stated that they don't have any problems with the proposal. And so essentially what would happen is we would go through the, the statutory process to vacate the right-of-way. The town line is at the center line of the, of the right-of-way. And so w once the town of Nagshead and the town of Kill Double Hills completes this process, each, each town would get the property to the center line, essentially to the town boundary. So today we're asking the board to adopt a resolution which would go ahead and begin the process to schedule the public hearing to um, vacate the right of way. I believe the public hearing would be at your next meeting in April. And um, 
the process is outlined in the staff uh, summary and you have the resolution in your packet. So we would uh, ask the board to consider adopting the resolution. Okay. All right, thank you. Do, does anyone have any questions for uh, Andy before we go into this? Make a motion, if you're ready. Yes, sir. Make a motion that we approve the resolution to begin the process of closing the portion of West 8th Street. Okay, is there a second? Second. I have a, a motion and a second. Any any further discussion? Uh, for the public who may be listening and not reading the resolution, this is to uh, potentially close the 300-foot portion of 8th Street located between Pond Avenue <coughs> and the Fresh Pond. Um, that was the last little stretch that um, runs between the two water plants. <coughs> A motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. The um, next item on our agenda would be items referred to and presentations from the town attorney. Mr. Lighty. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have one thing I wanted to. Um, uh, mentioned for the uh, board today <clears throat> um, on January the 1st uh, a legislative enactment Senate Bill 473 became uh, effective and I wanted to alert the board to this this is a um, interesting bill uh, that is has imposed a new conflict of interest provision that applies to members of a municipal governing board and prohibits you from serving uh, well, from either uh, making or administering a contract when the contract will benefit a nonprofit organization that you are on the board of. Um, it does not apply to nonprofit organizations that are created by an act of the legislature or by a municipality, but um, it would apply to the extent that the town were to enter into a contract with an organization such as the Home Builders Association or uh, the Roanoke Island Historic Association or something like that if you happen to be a member of the governing board of that organization. So um, I just wanted to alert you to that. I think this is something that has typically been considered to be a potential conflict and people have raised these issues before, but now it's been codified as a, as a real conflict. So. But it doesn't apply to boards that are created by the legislature or a part of the state government. That's correct, or or created by uh, by local government actions. So, um, so for example, the tourism authority would not apply to your role as a member of the tourism authority board in, a, in an agreement between the town and that organization because that's a legislatively created organization. That was going to be my question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate that, and we will have a closed session. Um, later when we come to those. Uh, the next item then on our agenda would be uh, presentations from the town manager and, and other updates. Uh, item J1, project updates, uh, beach nourishment. So this will be uh, David Ryan and uh, Andy Garman. All right, good morning again. So just wanted to give the board an update of where we currently stand with our beach nourishment permitting and uh, subsequent actions uh, necessary to move forward with our 2022 restoration project. Um, previously, we had reported out that we had received two out of the three permits. We had received the 401 water quality certification and the Division of Coastal Management uh, CAMA major permit. Um, the one remaining permit is the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it's my understanding that a that draft conditions have been uh, created for that, that that permit and that that is forthcoming. So at this point, um, we can move forward with issuing the notice of award and then subsequently uh, execution of the construction contract. Uh, there is some language that we had in there that the town attorney assisted with um, in order to go ahead and cover us until we receive that permit. Uh, but just wanted to make the board aware we're moving forward with the administration side of the, uh, the contract execution. Um, I also wanted to give the board an update 
as to the timeline that we can anticipate for the actual beach nourishment construction. We spoke with the contractor's representative yesterday to confirm it looks like right now they're gonna mobilize in um, around the mid-July timeframe for a beach fill construction timeframe of August 1 through August 30th, and then they would demobilize in, uh, in September. So in all, we're looking at about a 60-day window for mobilization, demobilization, and construction, and about a 30-day construction window, which is gonna be uh, much more rapid than what we saw in the past, um, and that's due to the um, reduced sand volume and reduced length that, uh, that we have proposed with this restoration project. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that the board may have. Are we notifying the rental management companies about the time frames? We, um, we have not gotten to, this, to that point, but um, yes, that's some, something that we can go ahead and do and, and give them advance notification. We just received um, word recently uh, to confirm this schedule, so at this point we can move forward with that notification. Thank you. Commissioner Green. No questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Commissioner Sanders. No questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda is a discussion of traffic enforcement. I'll call on Chief Webster. <clears throat> Mayor, Commissioners, thank you uh, for allowing us a little bit of time to talk about traffic enforcement and pedestrian safety. Now, traffic enforcement and pedestrian safety has always been and will continue to be a top priority for Nags Head Police Department. The department recognizes the key role that traffic enforcement plays in not only motorist and pedestrian safety, but also its impact on crime. Over the years, the department has not undergone any operational changes in the way traffic enforcement has been conducted. With the exception, in March 2020, COVID-19 changed the way we operated our standard operation. Officers were directed to limit proactive activity over consideration of force protection. This condition did not change significantly until February of 2021. <clears throat> Even after February 2021, an emphasis was kept on force protection with the onset of various COVID variants. The department's traffic enforcement methodology is multifaceted and includes area patrol. This is traffic enforcement during an officer's regular patrol duties. In other words, he's driving his normal patrol route, he sees a violator, he addresses that violation. Line patrol or saturation, proactive enforcement on a specific street or area. An example of that would be the change in the 45 mile an hour speed zone on the causeway. Directed, traffic enforcement conducted at a specific time and or place often focused on a specific violation. An example of that would be the school zone. We're there at certain times, morning and evening or afternoon, uh, and we focus on speeding. When the department receives a speeding complaint or concern, we address the complaint in a variety of ways dependent on the situation. We can deploy the radar trailer as a warning or educational tool and to gather data. We can address the complaint through directed enforcement, or we can partner with public services to conduct a speed study to analyze the complaint. In addition, we can have a combination of all three along with assistance of media. Training, all officers are trained in the use of speed measuring devices. The department continues to be a host site for state authorized traffic enforcement training. Additionally, all officers are trained in DWI enforcement. We use the intoxilizer and uh, administer uh, standard field sobriety tests. Officers uh, undergo advanced training. And for example, when uh, Christian Aguirre was here earlier, he's a drug recognition expert. And during our field training process, new officers receive additional training and traffic enforcement specifically to NAG's head. Uh, our equipment, all uniformed officers utilize vehicle mounted radar in either a stationary or moving or moving mode. Officers are also trained in the operation of LIDAR, which is basically a laser, a laser based handheld device, which allow us to focus on specific targets and enforcing speed. LIDAR is often, uh, we often deploy that in teams. The department utilizes other tools in addition to enforcement, including the aforementioned speed trailer, along with the message board and social media. 
In this regard, social media has been a game changer as an educational tool. The department often pushes out safety messages concerning roadway construction, biking, pedestrian safety, and speed zone changes. Our partnerships, the department participates in the Governor Highway Safety Program traffic initiatives, and the department also partners with the elementary school and the Bike Ped Coalition. The department leadership models the way in traffic education and awareness. This is done internally through communication with officers, for example, reminders of the cyclic effect of tourism, because we're gearing up now for the oncoming rush of, uh, of visitors, and issuing directives on directed patrols or saturation patrols. Leadership also works closely with the Bike Ped Coalition. We participate in Rotary. We educate the community during meetings and physically participate in events as walk, bike to school, and bike rodeo at Nags Head Elementary. The leadership and the department also materially participated in the education of J-1 students. The leadership has also taken an active role in uh, participation in the North Carolina Association of Chiefs of Police. Through this, we have a direct voice on issues affecting law enforcement. And I can tell you all over the past uh, year, year and a half, there has been a lot coming out of Raleigh about that's going to affect the way we police. Um, Senate Bill 300 has already, already been uh, uh, signed into law, which changes the way we <coughs> police and certain, certain databases and things and policies we have to keep. But there's also something else coming out of Raleigh that's being talked about and it's the reduction of law enforcement's ability to do regulatory stops. In other words, if someone's driving down the road with a brake light out, we can't stop them for that. And we can stop them for a moving violation and then address the brake light. But those, that's just an example of things that are, that are being discussed at the, the state and national level. Police uh, leadership was instrumental in partnering with planning and public services to implement a traffic committee to address roadway concerns and conditions. Police leadership led the way in implementing traffic studies to weigh complaints and, and properly deploy town resources. Uh, department leaders have also developed a partnership with NCDOT, giving us direct communication with their st staff to address issues. An example of that, I, I received a complaint out of Nags Head Acres just the other day about the light at Adam Street. And I was able to you know, send a quick email over to the contact at uh, DOT and he was able to get somebody out to look at the light. I don't have a report on what he found out, but they supposedly sent out a technician. And next I'm gonna present some traffic crime uh, data that the department has produced over the years. Hope y'all can see this. This is citations and warnings for the last five years. The first column is 2017. And you can see in 2017, there was 4,780 citations and warnings written during that year. This dropped to 3925 in 2018, uh, stayed at 3918 in 2019. And as you can see, 2020, it dropped dramatically. In 2021, it Citations and warnings are beginning to rise. I believe that's 2,900. I can't even see it. 2,900. Mm -hmm. And then 2022, obviously, we're just getting into the year. Um, you know, as far as 17 and 18, I wasn't here. Of course, Commissioner Brinkley was. I'm not sure of what was affecting those two years. I know that we, we had some staffing uh, that left in 18. Uh, 19, we were going through some training issues with some new staffing. Uh, of course, I know what happened in 2020, that was COVID. And in 2021, we began to rise from that level. But also, there's something else that, that, that can't be, that needs to be part of a discussion, and it is the impact that anti-policing uh, has had on our officers uh, from around the nation and the state. Uh, I've spoken to our officers. It is in the back of their mind when they try to stop a car. What if it's my time to be on the news? They, they consider this. I consider it when I go to meetings with my partners across the state. I mean, it's, some, it's a frequently talked about subject in law enforcement right now. <coughs> 
summertime citations and warnings. I thought it was very good to kind of break this out separately. In 2017, there were 1,941 citations issued between, uh, citations and warnings issued between May and September. That dropped to 1439 and 18, uh, 1411 I believe it is, and 19, of course dropped a lot in 2020 and climbed back up in 2021. Traffic extra patrols. Traffic extra patrols are, are basically an officer, when an officer is directed to address a, a particular traffic concern, if it's a directed patrol or a saturation, they'll write an extra patrol uh, document, which documents that they did the assigned task. And you can see that uh, it's, it was pretty high in 17, I think it's 453. David, you might can help me out. <laughs> and then it's dropped over the past few years, but it has remained fairly steady in that 400 range. Now with, obviously the, the whole purpose of writing warnings and writing tickets is education, is to change behaviors of motorists. And I think we have been successful over time. And you can see collisions by year has, has dropped uh, since 2017. We had 275 in 17, 265 in 18, I believe it's 239 in 19, uh, 196 I think, is that what it is? I can't make it out, but anyway, and it is, but you can see, you can see the overall decline in, in, uh, in collisions by year. Chief, where do the bulk of the collisions occur? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you back up? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. I, thank you. This one? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have that data available to show you, like which intersections are worse than others. I don't have that information <coughs> here in front of me right now, but I can certainly get it. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Intuitively, I know of some bad areas, but I would hate to just speak off the cuff and and have that not be appropriate. Okay. Pedestrian involved collisions, uh, I think we're very fortunate. We had a high of four in 2018 and that has gone down over the years to one last year. Uh, none of these pedestrian collisions uh, thankfully have occurred in any of our crosswalks. They have all been collisions that occurred uh, mid road. Hmm. Could, could you say that again, please? From what I understand of this data, the, the collision, the pedestrian collisions did, did not occur in crosswalks, and pedestrian crosswalks. Over what year period, I'm sorry? From 17 to 21. And I can double check that data. I, that just caught me, but I, I would do that. I can think of one in particular by an exit period. Kid ran out and into the crosswalk. Was that the one last year? Okay, I know we had one last year um, that was near the pier, but he was not in a crosswalk. I didn't know if that was the one you were speaking of, thinking of. Thank you. Uh, there's a correlation between crime and traffic enforcement. And what I did is I took just a snapshot of the group A offenses, um, burglaries, uh, assaults, uh, damaged property, vandalism, <coughs> narcotics offenses, and larcenies and thefts. And you can, see a, you can see a downward trend in most of these categories, although I think the one that's very interesting is the uptick in last year in drug and narcotics. This one's a little easy, this chart's a little easier to follow. It's, it's, it's the, the same group A offenses. Now I will say one thing though, in 16 and 17, they, the, these were being reported in UCR, uh, the Uniform uh, Crime Report. And in 18, we switched to a different system, NIVERS. And I think Commissioner Wrinkley could attest to the fact that it reduced our numbers. Uh, some of the numbers were not being counted. Uh, lesser included offenses, for example, if there was a burglary or B&E, and then there was a theft of property at that burglary and B&E, that larceny might not show up if that makes any sense. So what I really concentrated on was the burglaries and B&Es 
and how that number has dropped over the past few years. Now, one interesting fact I did see was the drugs and narcotics and how that has gone up in 21. And I don't know if that's a testament to just the overall narcotic problem which is plaguing our nation and seemed to have ri risen out of COVID. Um, because drug and narcotics offenses are normally offenses that you're gonna get at a traffic stop. That completes my presentation and I'll just end by saying that I'm willing to meet with any group or individual to explain our traffic initiatives and I also want to suggest that anyone who would like to learn more about our traffic enforcement to do a ride along with our, our police department. Thank you. Um, I believe I'm due to start down here with Commissioner Sanders with questions at this time. Um, I don't have any at this time. The uh, last slide that you had, drug offenses. Yes, sir. 30 and 42 and 16 and 17. What is what are you classifying as a drug offense, if you don't mind me asking? That was just the, the class A offense or the, yeah, the, the class A offenses that were reported. It could be a possession of any narcotic. It could be. So a, is it calls and complaints or arrests? It was, it was both, to my knowledge, it's, it's, it's calls and it's also <coughs> the rest, which make up those, each one of those categories, in fact. And again, I'm just, I yes, would sir. double check the number, just, it, it seems such a- It could be an incident or arrest, but I, I think, at least in my mind, most of the narcotics offenses are gonna be arrests. So for I'd the year of 2016, we had 30? I, and, and again, not now, yes, but sir. I would just, at, at yes. some opportunity, I would that, check that because I know, I, to, uh, 32 for the entire year that's the data I was given yeah yes, I, I would I would just double check that and I just I don't uh, doesn't I just sound even, right. what's that I said it doesn't sound right. yeah no it doesn't um, but anyway thank you for your for, for your presentation and I appreciate the the efforts that your officers make in uh, doing traffic and uh, traffic enforcement I do you know you talked about it at the beginning the, the priority it is a priority for your for your department and I hope that it what you're saying here to us today that it's a priority with you that 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 sense has been passed along to your first line uh, frontline supervisors so that that can be communicated with the with the staff um, I do have just I guess the one question I've got is in 2020 you produced a document uh, at the request of uh, then manager Ogburn and you I guess we're looking at green initiatives for the police department and you said that you were going to take the Nagsett Police Department from a traffic-centric agency to a community policing agency. And I'm curious what analysis you made to determine that the agency that you had, had inherited was a traffic-centric agency and what, and what changes have occurred since. And, that that's, and that's the information I was given when I first came on board. Uh, but I think, I think you do both. You know, I mean, I think you still have to focus on traffic but there's also, a, a, you know, there's room for community policing. I think you have to do both. I, I, I mean, without a doubt, and I, I'm not saying take one from the other. I would right. just, it kind of struck me uh, when I saw that and never really had a chance to talk about it because it was a green initiative. Didn't make sense why it was there, but being that we're talking about traffic fit enforcement, I want to ask it really no changes. You know, you were just told that it was traffic centric. Right, and so like I said, we've I've made no changes. I've not put out any sort of directive to anybody. Hey, spend more time doing X than doing Y. Uh, actually, tried to you know add on more community contact, you know, but without taking away obviously from traffic enforcement. Understood. Thank you so much, Chief. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Cahoon. No. I would like to, well, that's not true. I would like to know what intersections where the major accidents occurred. Yes, ma'am. Right. Um, going forward, um, you, you know that the, um, as, as Commissioner Brinkley said, you, you know, this, some of this is a priority uh, for, for the board. Um, and I have a sense that 
and, and you might clarify this, that, he, you know, there's certain kinds of software you use to track um, offenses um, and reports. <clears throat> and um, I would just say that if those systems are not adequate for the detail that the board may want in terms of locations or, or type, um, that you consider whether there may be a, other record keeping systems. Um, and e even if there's something that we need to do as a board, I think, so that we can uh, maintain ourselves accountable to the public in terms of, of maintaining safety and letting the public know that we're attentive to uh, areas of concern, I think that might be helpful. Yes, sir, and it's, um, it's, that's a great observation, and I can tell you all that there are some systems that are being recommended along with the county, uh, well, actually, Dare County wide, which hopefully will update our RMS uh, record keeping systems. Okay. Uh, I think one of the nice things that we may get out of this is AVL, a vehicle location, so we're able to see where, where through a heat map where officers are traveling, where uh, crimes are occurring, be able to produce, you know, a heat map or, you know, collisions or traffic enforcement, you know, I'm hoping it will give us a real good visual so we can see what's happening. Okay, good. Thank yes, you sir. very much. Appreciate Just that. One, one yes, quick sir. point. For, from your January report that we get for each board meeting, narcotics violations uh, for calls and complaints, 14 for January 2022, and the arrests were 20. So just, I'm just using that as an example of the 32 for the entire year has got gotcha. something's crossed up there. But thank you so much. I made a note to check that data. Sir? I made a note to check that thank data you, for, for 16 specifically. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate, yes, appreciate sir. that. <coughs> Next item on our agenda is, is a discussion of Jockey's Ridge State Park Soundside Access. Can, um, Manager Garman. Excuse me. Okay, thank you. Uh, as, as the board is aware, the uh, board had asked a working group uh, to look at issues surrounding the Jockeys Ridge Soundside access uh, during the course of last year. Uh, last April, I believe, the board adopted recommendations from that working group and subsequently sent a letter to the state <coughs> parks uh, asking for the state park to consider uh, the recommendations. Uh, we had been waiting on a response from the state parks uh, to have this discussion. And so we did receive a response through the mayor at the end of January, which was a response to our letter. And our letter included the list of recommendations and the state's response included the, the items that they felt like they were addressing based on our recommendations. Um, you know, I know a lot of people are interested in, in hearing about this and, and <clears throat> the response from the state and how well it addresses the recommendations of this working group. Um, the letters included in the packet, obviously the board has, has read that, primarily speaks to um, some of the recommend, recommendations including the opening and closing of the gate, which they feel like they're doing fairly consistently on, on the established schedule that the working group had, had agreed upon. Um, they're continuing to track traffic information inside <laughs> the access they have a traffic counting system, and they provided the, that data to us. Uh, back in September, we put together a, a white paper for the board with some information on, on the traffic in and outside of the gate and some of the things that we had done on the town side to improve some of the conditions outside of the gate. Um, you know, they mentioned that they're trying to encourage uh, Dare County Parks and Rec and other groups to carpool uh, when they're conducting activities at that access there. Uh, I think the, um, while they're doing that, there's still a lot of that activity occurring and uh, we are continue to be made aware of a lot of pick up and drop off activity outside of the gate due to the congestion inside of the gate. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, points of interest to, to the working group was the uh, parking inside the access. You know, I think that there was a, a feeling or sentiment on the working group that the parking should be limited to the original 23 spaces that were developed as part of the access. Uh, over the years, folks have been allowed to park along the west side of the drive aisle, which is creating additional parking and additional congestion in the access. 
as indicated by the, the data that we've seen. Uh, the working group preference was to limit that parking along that western edge of the drive aisle. Uh, the state in their letter in response said that they, they would continue to allow that. Um, since, since the um, letter was sent, I did have a chance to go and meet with Joy Greenwood, and we've discussed some of the, um, some of the res response and some of the things we could do moving forward. Uh, but we wanted to have a chance for the board to have this discussion about some of the things we might do in response to this letter before we uh, continue with, with any other activity. Um, one of the things that the board had discussed in a previous meeting was the improvements that are inside the access that the town had constructed. Uh, there, there are two walkways. One is further south along the drive aisle, which is older and provided a, an accessible platform uh, to look at the sound, but it did not provide access down to the beach. And there's another walkway further north that is newer, which is not accessible. Um, the, the walkway a little bit further south is in disrepair, and there was a question as to whether or not the town would remove that. I think there's a feeling between state parks and the town that that is really no longer necessary to provide any benefit to the, the park area. Um, the, other, the other outstanding <coughs> item that the board will eventually want to consider is moving forward. What, what is the arrangement between the state parks and the town in maintaining this access? Uh, as the board is aware, initially uh, there was a lease created between the town and the state that allowed the town to apply for CAMA grants to develop the access, and I believe that was the primary purpose for the lease because we needed to have site control in order to get grant funds. Uh, I believe that was done in the early 90s, and the, the timeline for maintaining the, the access according to the grant has expired at this time. And so now we're just dealing with improvements that the town created and uh, has been maintaining. And so the question moving forward would be, uh, if we no longer need the lease for any sort of grant uh, requests, then would we still have an agreement with the state parks to maintain the park or to establish roles and responsibilities for day-to-day -day maintenance? Uh, what was suggested by the working group was an, a memorandum of understanding and um, you know, I think we'll want to talk about what that looks like in the future and uh, how much uh, effort the town is going to put into maintenance of the access in light of uh, what some more modern or um, current uh, relationships have been. You know, the, the state has really taken over a lot of the maintenance inside the park, which was originally envisioned to be done by the town. and. Um, I think it's just more practical given the number of staff they have and the, their presence over there. Um, certainly we provide assistance when they ask us and we can continue to do that, to do some of the things that they're not, not really able to do. Uh, we've done some sand clearing inside of the access. We've done tree trimming and some larger items. We've also continued to construct structures, uh, but uh, you know we would sort of ask the board to consider moving forward if we would continue to do that. Essentially, you know, that's, that's where this is. You know, we have the letter um, and we're just looking for, for some discussion from the board on some of the thoughts you have on, on what this might look like in the future. Okay, all right, thank you. I think I'm due to start down this way. I like the idea of trying to have a better relationship with state parks. Um, I did see the letter from the, I guess the deputy um, so I think that would be important to have that line of communication as well as continuing to have a communication with Joy. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what any type of MOU moving forward would look like. As far, I guess my question is how much responsibility does the state want us to have and how much responsibility does the town want to have? Um, it doesn't appear that there's a whole lot of responsibility that the town can have within the boundaries of the access. I guess we're responsible for the entrance road, perhaps. I guess that would be on town property, I'm assuming. I don't know. Well, <coughs> and, and the improvements were constructed by the town originally as part of the grant, and you know we've continued to maintain the improvements there. Uh, but moving forward, you know, 
given the response and the, the level of uh, activity that we've completed over there, we would sort of question whether or not we would want to continue to invest in a facility that's really for the benefit of the park and, and it's part of their facility. You know, Commissioner Cunningham mentioned, uh, you know, having a good line of communication. I think that's that's important. I'm not sure if we had it when we sent a letter in April and we get a response on, was it January 31st? <coughs> uh, thank goodness Joy's a little more responsive than that, and I, I want to thank her for what she's done. Um, I, too, wonder what a MOU would look like, um, but I don't want, you know, you've got some residents there that were, I think they were kind of concerned that the town may abandon uh, kind of leave them out to dry, mm -hmm. you know, out to dry. I, I, I don't want that to happen. I think we, we need to be there to try to help uh, the residents there that do have these concerns. The last comment I'll make is, I, I've said it before, but the dry valve is not safe, in my opinion, for emergency vehicles to get by there, mainly a fire truck when they're parked on the side like that. Just looking at the pictures that have been provided, in my opinion, clearly shows, and I would hope that if they choose not to do it, that at least, if the fire department agrees, they may say they got plenty of room. Looking at it just from what I've seen, I'm just wondering if they truly do. So I hope at some point that that could be addressed and that if they don't want to limit parking there, that they know that they're creating a safety issue there. Thank you. And I, th I think that that <clears throat> situation is, is depending on the day, depending on the hour. You know, when you've got parking alongside the drive aisle, some people pull completely off the pavement, some people don't, and you've got doors swinging open into the drive aisle and a lot of people walking up and down trying to get to the walkway, which is further north, and traffic trying to flow in and out. So from a safety standpoint, it doesn't appear to be the most ideal condition. You know, and I understand people walking and doors coming open. I'm talking about the being physically parked in a manner. And right. you're right, some people get all the way off. Mm -hmm. If it's, you said it's time or day, it's that time and day and there's an emergency there and the truck cannot access it. Mm -hmm. Car fire, for instance, trying to get apparatus back there to save property. I just, I think it's a, it is a concern, but thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Sanders. Yeah, that was like, you hit on a good point. That was my first question is how safe is that drive aisle if people are parking on there? And um, I know that there's been some concern also about the uh, boardwalk on the south side that, that the town has constructed and how liable we might be if that is in a state of disrepair and doesn't need to be removed. Uh, those are my two biggest things and uh, keeping an open line of communication I think is important as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Commissioner King, were you going to say something else? Uh, just a question. In your presentation, did you say the northern boardwalk was accessible or inaccessible? Well, it's accessible in terms of ADA. It is not designed to be ADA accessible. It's stairs. There's no ramps. Okay. So it sounds like State Park needs to uh, come into conformity with uh, the laws concerning ADA. Yeah. For that. And I think if the south side is in such a state of disrepair, it should be removed and just have a central boardwalk for the participants to use. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined if the if the crossover that we built is in disrepair um, and the, and it's not really needed, it's not serving a benefit. Then the best thing we can do is go ahead and get rid of that, um, get get that out of there. Um, in terms of uh, um, any kind of agreement going going forward, I, I understand, I, I really believe that there are limitations on what the town can do inside the park. Um, we can deal with safety and traffic issues to the extent that they occur outside of the park. Um, but we, we have limited, um, you know, we can get uh, good faith cooperation, but we don't really have um, mechanism of control. I, I would like to see us have some kind of, of relationship uh, documented that laid out the roles and responsibilities, however limited they may be, um, and that maybe talk to uh, transparency and communication between the parties just so that people are not caught off guard by new construction or something suddenly happening that the town uh, wasn't alerted to and that, and that the town couldn't 
message to the public in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, I, th I think if we can get that, that will be beneficial. Right, thank you. Well, I guess, you know, so just to, to clarify a couple of things, um, we, can, we can offer to remove the structure on the south side that's in disrepair that we put there. Right. And we could do that with our own forces. So if the board wishes us to do that, we'll go ahead and do that, okay. arrange to do that. Let me ask the board, is it our consensus that they would remove that uh, walkway? Ah. Uh, yes. Okay. And then I can start working with Joy on, an, on a new framework for a new agreement. Yes, yes. That just reflects basically what, what the current set of responsibilities has, has been. Yes. Okay. And then I, I guess I will express the concern about the drive while from the town. I, that would seem to be appropriate as well. It's, uh, yeah. you know, in, in, anything, um, it, it, the answer to that being yes, but any safety concern I think is appropriate for the town to, to address. I mean, yes, it's the state park. Yes, we have limited actual responsibilities, but we also don't want an unsafe condition. If we uh, observe it, I think we have an obligation to uh, speak to that. I, and I, I think that that should be addressed. As part, of that, as part of that, would you work with fire to determine the accessibility? Yeah, I think that should be our first thing to just yes. see what their opinion okay. could be. And some of that could be just observing. I, th I think a survey uh, of conditions, different times of day, different mm -hmm. days of the week would be appropriate. I mean, that would kind of determine what, to what extent and scale it's a, it's a concern. And I, Commissioner Brinkley's right. Any time of day that you need to get in there and you can't get in there, that is a <coughs> concern. But we, we don't, we don't really know at this point how often that's occurring and, and mm -hmm. how pervasive that is. And it would be nice to have uh, some eyes on that. I, I think the, the last thing I would say is that, you know, I think they've expressed uh, interest several times on a desire to construct a turnaround inside the access. Mm -hmm. And so I think the feeling from, from their side is that uh, the working group really wanted this to stay static in terms of what it was originally constructed to be. They, they want the ability to make some level of improvement in the future. Mm -hmm. And so I think they feel like that's a reasonable request. That it's a reasonable request from the state to construct to, and improve. To do it. things that would improve the safety of the, of the yes. condition inside the park, like constructing a turnaround. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, I, I mean, my, my sentiment is whether they want to or don't, we have limited control, but that would go back to the communication piece that as long as they are transparent with us about what they're getting ready to do so that nobody is caught by surprise, I think that that's the best we can do. I mean, I think we, we can recognize that they, they do have control and the ability to do things like that. The fact that they are trying to work with us and, and gain approval and work with the community before they do things like that does speak to the willingness yes, to, to work in good faith. It does, and we appreciate that. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. And that brings us to your request for a closed session. Um, so we're going to have, uh, we'll, we'll lump all of those together. Um, <coughs> let's see. John, John, you have one to discuss an attorney client privilege item. I, I, that's not my request, but it, I think someone else may have had a request to do that. I accidentally put that in there. That oh, was not that's not, so okay, that, so that that is not. An open session. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. So we're not going to. So we do have two. Okay. Uh, which will be the personnel matter, and then the, and then the minutes. Minutes. Um, so, uh, Andy, do you have anything else? Uh, no, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, then that brings us uh, to the board of commissioners agenda and Commissioner Cahoon. Thank you. Um, presented for your consideration is the Government Education Access Channel annual budget. Um, if you looked at it, you'll notice that it has been reduced. Um, what we have been seeing is I think there are more, as more communities join and have government access channels, 
the pot of money that is distributed from the state goes down somewhat. And that is something that we are seeing. Um, and we are making a conscious effort to take less fund balance out each year since it, we were asked to reduce it, so we did for a while. We made some major capital improvements last, the past couple of years, which we're not doing this year. Um, we do have a new employee, so you'll notice that some of the health insurance and different things have changed. But um, we are within budget. Um, we have reduced our budget, and we're still trying to watch the budget. As a matter of fact, the town got approved at its last meeting for the request that was made for upcoming improvements to this room. So that's included in this budget. Okay. So um, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them um, as, much, as best I can. Okay. But uh, I would make a motion that the board approve this budget as presented for the town's consideration. Okay, thank you. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, we, we appreciate all the help that we get uh, in this regard. Um, and thank you for your continued service there on that on that board. If there's no further discussion, uh, uh, we have a motion uh, and a second to approve. And uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you. And I have one other thing. Yes. Um, I noticed in some of the notes from the manager that there's an upcoming meeting with DOT. Um, I would like to request that as part of that meeting, you bring up the condition of the pavement on 158, which I know they're planning on paving, but there are no lines in most of the places on 158 or on the causeway. And I've had an awful lot of citizen concerns that at night they can't see which lane they're in because there are no lines. Mm -hmm. um, and what inclement weather conditions such as rain, they really can't see where they're going on 158. Um, and it has become a hazardous situation. To me, it's a public safety situation. And would like to know how DOT is going to address that. Um, it appears that the paint they're using each year is cheap. It's not lasting. Granted, we have a whole lot more traffic, but usually the paint lasts longer than one year, and I think they do paint the lines pretty much almost every year, or seem to, maybe I, not. I don't think they paint. I, I think what my suspicion is what happened is because they, they were supposed to have repaved that a couple of years, a couple ago. years ago. And it's, I think they stopped painting. I think they stopped. Well, I know I saw them on the beach road. I did see them yes, on Highway they, oh, 12. Yes, they've done I that. I did see them on Highway 12, but you're right. They may not have done 158. I don't think they've been painting. I see them on 12 because they go right by. Yes, yeah, sure. But and 12 is in great shape. 12 is in pretty good shape with their lines. There are some that are not, but overall it's in much better shape. But yes. 158 really is a hazard. Yeah. And they need to, my understanding is they're not going to paint it this year. Did it say they were going to start in the fall, maybe? I thought repaving was supposed to start any time. Is that not true? <laughs> David probably knows the most about it. We, we, were, we were going to talk to them about that. Our understanding is that there will be a paving project this year. Um, but it may not address the more immediate concern. They said the fall, last I heard. Right. The, the resurfacing in the, the north end, um, which would include um, Kitty Hawk, Southern Shores, and Key Level Hills was supposed to occur this year, and then Nags Head was going to be broken out into next fiscal year. And <coughs> it appears that they're already behind on that schedule that they had passed along to us. So they won't get it done before the season, man. No, they won't get it done. It's going to take them forever to get it. If they're going to delay repaving that long, at least try to address the public Thanks. safety issue of the yeah, it is. It is a safety issue. About the lines. So yeah, if they're going to get, if they're going to end up another year. Then yes, it definitely needs to be painted. Okay. I'll mention that. Thank, thank you. you, Mayor. That's all for me. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Kevin, anything else to bring to the board? No, sir. Not at all. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Sanders. No, sir. Thank okay. you. Mayor. Thank you. Um, that brings us to the to the mayor's agenda and a request for closed session, but. Um, there's one thing um, I was inspired by John Ratzenberger's comments this morning about getting involved, and it's probably time for us to make another plug and appeal for service on boards and committees. Uh, that's a place where we're always trying to build up our reserves, and um, uh, I don't know if we can use a little clip of John and what he said <laughs> this morning, if we caught it on, caught it on video, but um, 
uh, he was an effective uh, spokesperson for uh, suggesting that people get involved. And, um, and so I would suggest that we, we make that appeal. Um, that's, that's really the only thing that I have um, that, I that I would add today. Um, then uh, just before uh, we make this motion for closed sessions, is there other business to come before the board that anyone is aware of? All right, seeing none, uh, then I would make a motion to go into closed session for the purpose of considering closed session minutes from January to December 2021 in accordance with GS 143-318.11A1, in addition to a closed session to discuss a personnel matter in accordance with GS 143-318.11A6. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The board will be in closed session.